This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Uh, given that we have a quorum of the town council available and on Zoom, uh, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.35 p.m. on March, on May 4th. Um, Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending call certain provisions of the open meeting law al allows us to hold this virtual town meeting. I'll call upon each counselor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. This is also how we will conduct counselor comments and votes throughout the agenda. Similarly, at times when we need other people to speak, we will check to make sure that you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, the meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There's no chat room, but there are attendees. At this point, I'm showing as many as five. Um, if there are technical issues, please let Sean or Athena know, and they will work with you. And for people who are tuning in, uh, some of you will be on Amherst Media and some of you, will you, of you will follow the meeting. There are instructions on the town website, which we'll also so show later as to how to make public comment. So with that, uh, let me take roll of the councilors present. And we'll start with uh, Shalini Balmain. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Sarah Schwartz. Present. Okay, all of us are present. There are no absences. So we are going to begin with just a few updates. If you'll put the agenda up on the calendar, up on the screen. I just want to call out a couple of uh, upcoming meetings. These are on your agenda that's posted in the packet. Next week, we will do a financial update on the financial indicators. That will be a special meeting of the town council, school committee, and library trustees. There will be no public comment, but there will be many of opportunities to make public comment on the financial condition of the town and the agenda going forward. We will then have a regular town council meeting on May 18th at 6.30. I want to note that the meeting on the 11th next week is at 5.30. There are various upcoming committee meetings as well. The Community Resources Committee is meeting on May 5th, tomorrow at, 20, at 2 o'clock. The Governance Organization and Legislation Committee is meeting on May 6th at 10.30. The Finance Committee is meeting May 12th, following that indicators meeting at 2.30. The Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee is meeting on May 11th at 9.30. And Town Services and Outreach Committee is meeting on May 18th at 11.30. Uh, we have no hearings this meeting. Hello, Darcy. Yeah, it's the, the 18th meeting is at 9.30 in the morning. Thank you. So on the bottom line here, Town Services and Outreach Committee is May 18th at 9.30 p.m. That was a.m., excuse me. We will make that correction, thank you. Um, moving on, we have no hearings uh, and we do have a couple of upcoming district meetings, but I'll talk about that at the end of the agenda. 
it is time for general public comment. And I'd like people, you to show the general instructions on the screen, as well as the website people connect to. Thank you. So um, doing public comment during um, Zoom meetings is a little different, but now it's pretty much the same rules. Uh, you may express your viewpoints up to three minutes. Uh, if there are too many people, I might ask people not to speak for that long. And the council will not engage in dialogue or comment or matters raised during public comment. Um, so I'd like to um, exit and go over here. And I see that we have one hand up. Identify yourself by name and where you live. And please adhere to the three minute rule. Peter Therese. Can you make sure that Peter's mic is available? Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, my name is Peter Trez. I live at 101 Cherry Lane. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the local restaurants that have been the backbone of our town and a source of community for all who live here for my entire life. Um, I've grown up in Amherst and it hurts to see the local restaurants struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've come up with a plan that could help to alleviate some of the stress on restaurants and provide an outlet for the Amherst community to support their favorite establishments. Uh, I've spoken with a couple restaurant interests in the interests in the town, and so far Formosa and Freshside are both interested. Um, is there any way that I could use the webcam to show um, to show something? Or we have not made for that provision, but we would invite you to please send it to the town council at AmherstMA.gov. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, so I can explain. Um, so basically. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, car hop tray drive-in diners were extremely popular around the United States. And my plan would be to designate an area in town that could be used for restaurants to serve customers using the hop tray method, which complies with social distancing while also providing the uh, desired dine-out experience. Not only would this provide a new avenue of business for restaurants, it would also support the general Amherst community to bring people together. Um, for those of you not familiar with car hop trays, it's basically, I have an example here, but I'll explain it. Um, it's basically an aluminum tray that hooks onto your car window and allows restaurants to serve food to customers who are able to, to have the dine out experience from the safety of their vehicles. Um, my, my plan was to designate the, the parking lot across from Grace Church, which is nearby a bunch of local restaurants as a car hop tray area that restaurants could serve customers um, there. And um, it, would, it would provide a way that customers could have the dine out experience and support local restaurants. And I just wanted to bring this to the attention of the council and the public, since the administration of the town of Amherst is so critical in making this reality. Um, I'll be reaching out to key members of town leadership as well as restaurants in coming days. And for anyone who'd like to be in contact, my phone number is 413-992-8492. And my email address is p-t-r-e-y-z at gmail.com. Um, and I look forward to pursuing this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment, Peter. Is there any other public comment at this time? Okay, then we are going to conclude public comment and go back to the agenda. We have no proclamations or commentation, commemorations at this time. Uh, however, we do have both a presentation by the Chamber of Commerce and the bid, uh, and then Paul Bachelman will present on the COVID update. But first, we're going to start with Bid Director Gabrielle Gould and Chamber of Commerce Executive Director Claudia Pasmani. So I believe we have slides, and could you please just tell us which set of slides 
you would like. And I want to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. Claudia? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Gabrielle? I can hear me. Great. Thank you. And please let the... Um, okay. I believe that's the, those are the slides you want. Is that correct? Uh, it's the Creating Resilient Amherst package. Okay. Create Resilient Amherst. Sean? It's going to take me a second to find that. It'll be up. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. It's okay. Let me just preface this while we're waiting. Um, at the invitation of the Community Resources Committee, um, Claudia and Gabrielle have talked with a good portion of the councils. I believe it was 10 of us were available that day. And we are in the process of talking with them on a weekly basis. The topic, as you might suspect, is basically how to reopen Amherst. And um, tonight we're carrying that conversation just one step further, or maybe several steps further with um, the results of some discussions that Claudia and Gabrielle have had with their constituents and members. Lynn, um, John Page sent us a corrected copy of this at around 3.57. I have in my email, and I could forward it to Sean. Um, I if, assume he has it, but I think I'm going to check with you on all of that. I'm getting a copy of it now. It'll be up shortly. Okay. Thank you. I think Gabrielle and Claudia, could, you could start introducing yourselves because it'll take a minute for this to get up. There's been a delay in Zoom lately. If you'd okay. like to do that. Yeah, great. Go ahead. Hi. I'm Claudia Pasmani, Executive Director of the Amherst Area Chamber. Uh, Gabrielle Gould, Executive Director of the Amherst Downtown Business Improvement District, as well as the Amherst Downtown Foundation. And Gabrielle, why don't you give us a little bit of background on the foundation's formation? Um, so the foundation was originally started as a cultural and arts foundation. Our intention was to raise money to um, build and donate to the town a performing arts structure on the common, um, as well as um, give that with a uh, maintenance fund and a programming fund. When COVID-19 hit and we started hearing both at the chamber and the bid from local businesses, um, and the hits that they were taking, Claudia and I started discussing how we could pivot. And we decided that the best way to do that was to take the newly founded uh, Downtown Amherst Foundation, which is a 501c3, and turn it into a micro grant making foundation for local brick and mortar businesses. In less than two weeks, we have raised over $174,000 towards our goal of $500,000. Um, we opened our first round of grants on May 1st. That grant process will uh, be open from May 1st through May 8th. 
We will then close that window. Our committee of five um, who have a lot of experience in grants and nonprofit work as well as for-profit businesses are going to review them and they will allocate the funds from the first $150,000. And we will be busy raising the next amount. We are calling this a sustaining grant and we are looking forward to our next round of grants being an opening grant. Okay, so the slides are up. So let's begin the presentation. Thank you, all right, next slide. And the next slide since we've introduced ourselves. So we're really here to talk about a resilient Amherst. And I think um, what's really important for everyone to understand is we come to you, A, as representatives of our businesses um, and looking at our economic vitality, but also because of every everything you're hearing today is a culmination of what we've heard, what we've talked about, what we've surveyed. I mean, this is a real reflection of boots on the ground and what we have heard and we, we want to bring to, to the town council um, and to policymakers so that we can look at reforming policies, procedures, and practices to reflect this new reality that we're in. Um, and I love the restore, rebuild. I feel like we get a chance to redo, um, you know, restore a lot of um, some of the things that would make us fantastic to rebuild, restructure, rebrand, um, becoming this resilient Amherst, um, and really talking about us as a year-round economy, leveraging our unique assets, the arts and cultural aspect, the natural environment, the rich history, um, that are complemented by the university and colleges, but not just those that singularly define us. Um, and again, that's part of the redefining. And then of course the reopening. Everyone is talking about rolling out plans of reopening. We want to be and put our businesses and our community in as safe a position as possible, but also in as strong a position as possible for us to restart. Um, so we just, we have an opportunity to kind of look at things a little differently. And so um, this really speaks to um, based on everything we have heard and what we have seen our businesses experience, um, we're coming to you with this um, as what we see as an incredible um, step up and um, for our businesses and for our community. So next slide. So we thought we'd start with just a quick step and look back pre-COVID. Um, unfortunately, we have this pre-COVID and post-COVID you know, <laughs> in our new lexicon now. Um, but what this demonstrates is, you know, the 40% piece we're looking at here is healthcare and social assistance represents as, represented all of our businesses pre-COVID. Um, and what's interesting in that is that these are the, and this is the piece that's so hit, hard hit right now, outside of, you know, our, our restaurants and our, our um, tourism and so forth, and probably hitting some of their worst, um, fears and <laughs> the most challenges structurally. Um, and also we're seeing record numbers of folks who need those special services. So such as food insecurity is four times the need right now. So, um, you know, so that makes sense that those are some of the greatest needs that we're seeing. But we also see that 60% of employment was through our educational institutions, right? Um, but that was also before. We don't know what it's going to look like um, because we don't know what those decisions are yet about whether the university will come back online or not or come back in person. And that can really change. Um, so these numbers are going to really, really look a lot different. And our unemployment rate was at like at, at an all-time low of 3%. So um, and we had a strong workforce, strong number of healthy number of businesses. Uh, I mean, the reality was having a small business was never easy. But um, we certainly had, you know, we have anchors, we have those favorite places. And if anything has come from this is that we've seen such an outpouring of support from the community to support local and they want them back. So um, Gabrielle's gonna talk a little bit about now what we're seeing after. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, am I doing that one? I am doing that one. <laughs> um, so, was, did I miss one? I feel like I missed one. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, so we took a survey and I want to thank um, John Page who so beautifully put together this presentation. He really called so many comments from so many different areas from our surveys, from businesses, from Gabrielle, from myself, from our offices um, and put these beautiful presentations together and really pulled the data. And 
So we took a survey, uh, the bid took a survey early on in this process when they were just, the PPP was just coming out. And then we felt like, okay, the first round had come in and we really felt like we needed to take another pulse on our businesses to see where they were at. Because how much, how much further could they extend in this, you know, limbo area uh, before um, they're going to face their own really even harder decisions. So this kind of highlights some of the big ones. You know, it goes down to, um, you know, basically we're seeing a $56,000 loss per month per business. Um, that's a huge economic hit. Um, so that affects, uh, affects obviously the employees, 61% of uh, employees laid off and 36% able to transition partially or fully. Now, some of that um, speaks to there was a lot of innovation mm -hmm. that came out of this. There was some really exciting stuff that came out, but the reality is that um, what we're really going to see, what we really saw was 25% said they are not going to make it to June 1st. We asked this question directly, what do you think with PPP, with other support that they've reached out for? Um, that's a 25% loss that perhaps, and I've seen that and we've seen that in other reports across the country. Um, but I, there is some good news that we've seen more, you know, more restaurants come online. And again, there's been a lot of innovation and a lot of creativity. Um, but, and this does not include what may happen with, again, employment and changes at our big, our, our flagship and at Amherst College, um, and also at our local school system. So we don't know what the fall response is going to be quite yet. So this is pre that, right? So this is where we are right now. Next slide. So I'm gonna let these numbers speak for themselves. Um, this is what we're seeing in um, all of Massachusetts. Um, they're staggering, we all know this. Um, everybody on this call, and I believe everybody who is listening in has access to the 60 plus page economic study that was conducted and put together so nicely by John Page. And I'll let this go to the next slide, please. Claudia, I'll run with this one. Um, again, these are the things that we have done to help. We mentioned all of these at the CRC. Nothing has changed. We are continuing. Uh, we are a center for information at both the chamber and the bid. We have a consistently um, changing and updated uh, who's open for business and how they are doing business list. Again, as Claudia said, we've had a lot of incredible innovation in our uh, Amherst area. Um, people are really looking outside of their normal business plan and those who can legally be doing business are finding ways to do so. I do wanna stress that it, it, it is at a much lower percent than any business should run, but they're here and they're doing it and they're making headway. Uh, we also have the tip jar, which has been up for several months now. Um, this is a way for um, all of us to get online and say, look, I, I had a favorite hairdresser or a bartender or a waiter and a way to tip them while they are suffering this unemployment. Um, it's a great resource. Again, I already spoke about the uh, resiliency and micro grant program with the Downtown Amherst Foundation. I do want to stress that although the word downtown is in the name of the foundation, this is an Amherst wide initiative. Um, and again, the applications are open for brick and mortar businesses all across Amherst. And those can be found at downtownamherstfoundation.org. The application is live. And then we are working with the town of Amherst um, on a weekly basis, as we said, and coming to these meetings with you on a long-term economic recovery plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so drum roll. This is really about preparing for reopening and what um, we see as really important steps. And again, they duly preserve the public health um, while looking at the economic health of our community. So anything we're talking about should be prefaced with keeping in mind the safety of our businesses, their employers, the employers and their employees, and that of our community. Um, and also keeping in line with any of our announcements from our um, from our state. Right. So. But what can we consider locally? What can we do locally to start leveraging and preparing so that when those you know, phases of reopening happen through the state, how can we move that forward? Um, so one of those pieces is leveraging the opportunity to complete physical improvements. Um, sidewalk repair, uh, 
sidewalk repair, power wash, beautification, placemaking. A lot of that has already begun. But I think in terms of what we were looking at is consumer confidence and building, you know, health is a big piece. How we prepare ourselves and position ourselves as a town is going to be really important. And actually, you've seen this starting to happen in other towns where um, we're really uh, cleaning up. So um, this is an important piece. And then leveraging funding sources. We've talked a lot about with the town, with Lynn, we talked um, with our state representatives, emergency CDBG funding, which is community development block grant funding to address food and housing insecurity um, and social services to support our most vulnerable. Um, and it's both for um, workers and residents. Again, this is to, you know, to really protect everyone. Um, but we'd like to see some of that we know that food insecurity and housing insecurity are probably the largest in terms of social services. So we recognize that. Um, but also, you know, we also have a lens for, we have the micro grants to help the businesses. So it's really a nice balance. Um, the housing trust and the CPA funds to address housing insecurity through rental assistance program. Um, we have requested um, that the AG Small Business Relief Partnership grant that would be coming to the town to consider um, gifting that to the Downtown Amherst Foundation's Relief and Resiliency Fund so that we can, um, again, sustain our small businesses. So this is a big piece of what we're doing. Um, and then FEMA and MEMA funds to address public health infrastructure, um, including hand washing stations, PPE uh, testing, rapid testing. Um, this is stuff that you know we saw in our surveys that this was a lot of extra expenditure on our small businesses and anything we can do to you know, stop the flow of cash out for them uh, in, in terms of costs. And, um, and this is stuff that's required anyway, right? And this also is so important for us to ensure that, that when uh, they come online, that everyone feels really confident, they are, they are confident in our businesses and that we are prepared. And so these are the things that are the minimum and that are going to be in a minimum in our state standards. Um, and also produce reopening guidance and operating procedures, whatever they are, that we have them listed, that they're easy to access, um, and that we all work together to create those and get those out to our businesses and business owners. Um, next slide. And we really talked about at length leveraging our outdoor and public spaces. So we talked about utilizing public spaces like roads, sidewalks, common space. So Peter was right in line, our, our friend, our public commenter um, was right in line with a lot of the areas that we had in mind and a lot of the ideas. I feel like our businesses have already begun to innovate. Let them continue to innovate. Um, let's give them opportunities to uh, reach out. We've seen some plans that will consist of, um, you know, the, the state may come down with a plan that says no indoor dining. You know, how do we maximize outdoor dining? So a, a shared space um, is exactly the type of thing we're thinking about. And how can we how can we make that happen safely, um, but also let businesses thrive? Uh, permit the farmer's market and retail market outdoor sales to, to again, how can we be adaptive and permit that? Um, they are starting to open up around. We know that there's a lot of produce uh, readily available. We love to support local farms. And we're built on agriculture here. Let's Let's continue that um, and make that happen and expedite permitting for pivot to outdoor again. And then adopting a temporary parking policy that encourages visitation. Um, so what we shared earlier, those statistics are in full format of a survey that we took. The survey results were not going over today, but we have submitted them and they are will be available after this meeting. And you'll see the responses were for either free parking or no enforcement for 30 days or 45 days after the state emergency is lifted um, or extended recovery period um, that first hour recovery to maybe two hour free parking so there's lots of variations but again uh, the idea is whatever we can do it to encourage people to come come to our town and, and come and dine and, and shop and also that we're all consistent with the open for business messaging town chamber bid that we all work and, and town council um, that we all work on uh, what you know what restores these health guidelines but restores consumer confidence next slide that's 
So uh, again, in working with the town or in conversations with the town and then conversations with many of our local businesses, our developers, our property owners, um, we have put together a pretty um, succinct list. We feel there is a lot more to back all of this up and we look forward to being um, brought to either the CRC or the council to go in deeper, but we'll just run through them. Um, Number one is the um, hiring of an economic development director for the town. Um, that is a position that has been vacated for um, fiscal uh, calendar year 2020. And we're looking forward to seeing the efforts to bring that online um, come to fruition. Um, investing in public in infrastructure. Um, we, we cannot speak enough to not delaying these capital projects. And we say this knowing where the, the, you know, the funding gaps are going to be. And, um, you know, there are ideas around that. And I, I think that those are going to be very important, especially as drivers for people to come and want to be part of our Amherst community. Um, again, moving forward with that destination Amherst that seems a, a lifetime ago that we presented to the town council, a five part series that started with the Kendrick Park, which we know is going forward, uh, moved on to a parking garage behind the CVS, um, which needs some rezoning, um, looking at the uh, performance stage and arts and culture becoming a part of our common on a regular basis, and the improvements to the North Common um, area that the main street parking area and the surrounding and um, those those are very important and they they shouldn't be put on the back burner um removing the roadblocks and barriers to economic development um, adopt an expedited local permitting best practices um this is something that is going to include all permitting from around the entire second floor um, all the departments um the removal of the design review board um if we go to form based code um, that review board is no longer necessary. It's an antiquated uh, system. Move appropriate items from special permits to site plan review. Change our marijuana buffer zone to tap into this opportunity for our downtown and adopt staff recommendations to simplify and clarify zoning bylaws. Again, we know we're giving you bullet points. We do have um, more information on all of this, but we don't want to have you here until 2 a.m. tonight. Next slide, please. Okay, um, there's a lot to discuss about planning and zoning. Um, the easiest and number one is to align the zoning bylaws with the master plan goals that have already been created. Um, the creation of des density and mixed use development in our downtown and the village centers across. Um, really looking at BL to BG or putting BG into the footnote B. Um, again, utilizing these overlay districts to achieve the density that creates a thriving and vital community and town centers and areas. Um, look at grants for funding and out outreach, education, energy efficiency, and carbon footprint assessments for all of the above. And to partner where we can with the Mass Historic Preservation and to see what we can do to work with them to retrofit some of our older buildings and bring them um, into a more carbon neutral footprint. Um, also looking for grants from them. Um, implement complete streets models. Um, I know that this is a conversation. We all know that this is part of the master plan, but now's a great time to start really moving forward with a walk and bikeable community. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a lot, <laughs> uh, but I think that the response to this particular um, era that we're in is something that can be characterized as a fully cooperative and collaborative effort. Um, we have been talking to more partners than ever, and you've heard, you know, every department at town hall has been mentioned to, you know, this is going to take all of us and our business community, our property owners, individuals, our educational institutions, every housing advocate, social services, government, all of us working together uh, to think creatively. And again, we're coming to you so we can be more proactive um, so that we can, you know, remove inhibitors and, and barriers um, for the long, for the long term economic growth as well. It's not just for tomorrow. I think these are also items that we're uh, putting out there because we want to expedite them. We want, um, and we want to put in a practice of thinking big. This is a time, uh, you know, where, again, I said that, you know, we talked about unity. And um, I, when we talk about a young person who comes to get in front of town council with this great idea that, you know, um, let them innovate. I think this is the time. And a lot of this is about all of us coming together and thinking about, 
uh, things that not only will help us reopen, but have a really positive long-term impact. Uh, next slide. So next steps um, to introduce specific policy proposals to the CRC uh, when we can be invited to meet with them um, to keep and continue to work collaboratively with our business community, the town manager and the staff. Uh, we look forward to our weekly meetings with um, Paul, Lynn, David. Um, those have been invaluable. Um, when available, inform our stakeholders of Massachusetts Reopening Task Force guidelines. Um, we all know that there has been a um, delegation and that our neighbor in East Hampton, Mayor Nicole LaChapelle, is on that. We look forward to meeting with her, working with her, and hearing about what these guidelines are going to look like. Again, um, we just want to reiterate that we, we believe that our, our governor Baker is going to hand down the guidelines and help us, you know, return to whatever the new normal is as a state. Um, what we are hoping is that we are, we can get ahead of those and we know what those, you know, once we know what those are, we can help our entire business community implement those so that we return to this new normal as safely as possible in line with Governor Baker's uh, requirements and protocols for a new way. And we look forward to doing that with the town and we look forward to doing that for and with our businesses. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by asking counselors who would like to ask a question or make a comment um, uh, on this very exciting and somewhat explicit uh, presentation. So Andy Steinberg has his hand up. Yes, thank you. First of all, I wanna thank our two presenters for a very informative and helpful presentation. Uh, there were some things that I thought about as you were uh, speaking, and uh, I'm sure that Paul is gonna to have to deal with them at next week's meeting to the extent that there are financial implications to some of the things that you asked. So I'm not going to try and go into any of that today. There were two questions that uh, I wanted to pose. They may not have an answer today, but I think it would be helpful at some point to get them. One is that um, in the survey and in your presentation today, there was a lot of discussion about the importance of parking which is an indication that the feeling of the business community is that using um, automobiles, privately owned automobiles for the most part, um, to get to uh, businesses is an important element to supporting them. But no mention was made of public transportation. So I was uh, curious wh uh, whether there's been any effort to quantify the importance of bus service um, to the business community. And then the second thing is that you talked about um, the importance of moving forward with the uh, four major capital projects that we've um, considered. And um, this is the one that I was thinking is maybe very difficult to answer today if you don't have the survey to back it up now, but it would be helpful at some point to know whether any of the specific projects seem more important um, to the business community to stimulate the kind of uh, recovery that you're talking about. So those are my questions, thank you. Uh Andy, I'll take your second one, and then Claudia, I'll let you take the first one about transportation. Um, Andy, I've been speaking to a lot of uh, office holders, uh, stakeholders in the major cities, uh, namely New York, Miami, and Boston, um, some contacts I have there. And there is a real feeling that there's going to be a migration, uh, call it pandemic flight, if you will. And I think Amherst is a location that would be well sought after. It's been proven, unfortunately, that not everybody needs a big fancy office. And although none of us want to continue working from home because that's also being proven to not be great, um, I think that there's going to be a lot less focus on uh, that capital expense for large businesses, I think it's going to allow people to move to places where their quality of life is far better. And they'll commute into the city every 10 or 12 days. They'll still need a small office space, which would be great for our area. So I look at these capital projects, especially um, the school, uh, the library, when I think about what it is to be a young, uh, you know, well uh 
financed professional and where I would, well, I chose to move here because of that. Um, I chose to move here because we had a great community. And I think that we can, we should continue to try to build on that great community. And I think anybody looking at where their quality of life can be good within a radius of where they can commute on that, you know, sort of every other week basis is going to be based on what the community has to offer. And those five projects are an incredible incentive. And in terms of your first question about parking, I have to say that we too were um, surprised that there was a really prevalent uh, response from our area businesses around the concerns over parking. Um, we certainly want a walkable, busable, you know, bikeable downtown. We have Valley Bikes, but that, it wasn't really part of our survey. But at the same time, um, certainly something to look forward to in terms of what we can ask in the future. It may not be the last survey, um, but, um, you're right, I, this, the jury is out. I, I don't know, um, we didn't, those were just free form answers and we didn't really specific, particularly attack that one issue, but it's good to know for future surveys. Uh, D'Angelo, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, you know, thinking about creating a resilient Am Amherst and the way that we really need to come together, one of the, um, um, building blocks were part of this is the educational institutions. And I guess um, I know kind of what the town does to reach out to them, but what is BID or the chamber doing to reach out to the institutions, particularly Amherst College that is so well funded um, or UMass in terms of participating with donations to the town, uh, donations of land, um, what, what are you doing with them, I guess? Uh, we speak to both the college and the university. I speak to the university on a weekly basis. Um, I speak to the college on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, we had a very positive meeting with uh, Amherst College um, regarding the, the uh, foundation and that uh, resiliency grant program. And we're waiting to hear back from them on a substantial ask from our part. Um, in terms of Pat, like specifically to land and other items like that, um, we, we have not yet been part of that conversation. It doesn't mean that we would shy away from it. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that Amherst College said, where goes the town of Amherst goes Amherst College. And I thought that that was a, a good sentiment. Okay. Evan. Yeah, um, so I had, I had a couple things and it's a little bit tricky because some of these may be for Claudia, uh, Claudia and Gabrielle um, and maybe some of them are more appropriate for the town manager. Um, specifically, there was a mention of the AG Small Business Relief Partnership and funds that could be coming from that um, and the possibility of um, handing that off to the Downtown Amherst Foundation. Um, I, I'm not really sure. I don't know what the status is of those funds or, or if we have to apply. Um, or what the conversations around that have been like. So I'd be interested to hear more about that. Um, one thing that I'm also interested in, you know, you all have done a lot of work, and I think that survey um, is, is both scary, but I'm glad we have that information. Um, but one thing that I was curious about, you know, there's a really interesting article uh, recently in the Boston Business Journal about how um, this pandemic has hit minority-owned businesses especially hard and that, you um, uh, black, Latino, and Asian-owned businesses are uh, disproportionately likely to be turned away from PPP and, and whatnot. Um, and so I was curious, um, and I, I don't expect you to have this answer now, if there was any trends in the survey response um, with regard to, to that. Um, I know there was one thing in the document about who had been turned away or not received PPP for different reasons. Um, and just wondering if that's also something the Downtown Amherst Foundation could look at when they're looking at who to give grants to. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to do, and again, this is probably more for the town manager, but just talking, uh, I'm not too sure um, if people, if we're looking at moving dining outside, which just sounds like might be a, a good thing um, for a lot of those businesses that outside is gonna be on the sidewalk in a public way. And so I'm not 100% clear on um, process wise what that means from both the permitting perspective to be able to permit outside, but also the way, which is the realm of the council. Um, and it, if, if that's something that we're gonna be looking at soon, it would be nice to have some clarification of what that uh, looks like uh, 
because I think that might be something we want to move on sooner rather than later. I'm going to actually ask Paul to take the two questions that were town manager questions. Okay. So, um, yes, we've had some internal conversations about what it would mean to do the outdoor dining, but not anything um, extensive to tell you exactly where the line would be between what could be approved internally by uh, our inspectors and by our building and building commissioner uh, versus what would have to happen with the council. I think it's a conversation that we'd want to have in terms of, is this a direction we want to go in as a community to support our local businesses? Um, and the, in terms of the AG money, you know, again, we haven't had a detailed conversation that, that was raised by the bid in the chamber. It's something that we've, it's kind of intriguing, uh, but we haven't, I haven't pursued that with them uh, aggressively at this point in time. And I'm going to add, Evan, just that on the issue of any use of the public way in any permanent or semi-permanent way, long-term way, would absolutely come to the council. And, um, but it is a combination of both permitting as well as public way use. Okay. Uh, and uh, Claudia or Gabrielle, um, the trends, if you've seen them. Uh we did not ask that specific question on the survey. Our grant application does address that very specifically. And I will tell you right now that out of the applications we have received, one of the questions is also um, have they applied for and have they received the PPP and the idle? And I can tell you anecdotally without it in front of me and specific that yes, we are hearing it and we are seeing it. There is a disproportionate. And I've heard it anecdotally. Yep. Kathy Shane. Thank you. Um, I have a, a comment that builds on or a question that builds on Andy's and then something that is a uh, jump to a uh, different topic that was raised in your presentation. On the four capital projects, um, if I step back and look at what the town is facing, as you talk about a resilient Amherst, we have to have a resilient town budget in Amherst um, financing the people who work here. And we're looking at a coming year that we're gonna do well if we could even hold a constant budget and capital, the big capital projects are gonna um, be on a back burner um, just for the type of financing we're gonna be able to afford unless people are looking to see tax increases and tax overrides. You know, so we're, we've got a reality check of we're a business, we're just um, a public business under a lot of stress. So the point of the, that Randy raised about preferences and rating of priorities, when we had the listening sessions on the four build it projects, the schools came out very high and the library came out very low. And I don't think it's because people don't value the library. They love the library, but they feel like the library is in pretty good shape, um, you know, other than some repairs. So I just think, you know, being a little bit more nuanced on where the investment dollars by the town as people think about it rather than one large cluster. Um, unless you have success in going to Amherst College, the way an Am William stepped up and said, let me help you build your elementary school <laughs> and help you finance it. You know, we have some deep pockets in town. It's just not the town government um, and it's not the average businessman. So just it's, it's kind of food for thought on differentiating a little bit. Then also on your, your comments on opportunities to think differently and remove barriers, but also think of things like complete streets and starting to build that into our design. Um, I think it would be important for some of the businesses to start weighing in when planning or the design review board are faced with a developer that wants to build out to the edge of an already narrow sidewalk rather than move the space back and allow for outdoor seating, allow for a bike path and trying to think about what the street feels like to people and opportunity for walkable, bikeable spaces. And we, we don't have those in um, the width of a sidewalk or some of the setbacks. And we have one that's coming up with us later today, but it's been noticeable to me that we talk about the complete streets, but it's not always when it's not already in existing. So trying to think about 
what it takes to get that kind of vibrancy, um, you know, around different issues. So again, it's it's uh, some support of the developer community and the design community to say, you know, this really makes a difference. A place feels very different if it's a big, tall building, but it's not right in your face, or the second floor moves backwards, or there's more outdoor seating. Um, and I know you think this way, but I just think bringing that into a full circle would be important. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and I think that that goes back to zoning. Um, those things have to be put in zoning because the fact of the matter is, is that if you have an inch that you're allowed to build on, chances are you're going to. So those come back to zoning. And I think that that's part of the conversation and the action that is desperately needed to move forward with some zoning reform. Uh, and I'm sorry, to answer your first question, I, I believe, um, I'm going to say that economic development is going to be imperative to moving forward um, as a town in terms of success and financial success. Um, and yes, that includes economic development that works with the college and the university. But without that person really fighting for and looking for the opportunities for us, we're going to lose. Out. Valerie? Yeah. So um, just appreciating the different stakeholders you've engaged with, um, the bed and the chamber. So uh, that's, I think, giving us a lot of information to work with. The town council has a lot of work, I can see. Uh, I was, um, it was, I mean, there's some things that seem very doable and, ha and can be handled, like public safety guidance for reopening and that was a little surprising for me and also actually comforting to see that businesses actually want to open gradually and not in a hurry. They want to do it in a good way. And I think that's something we can control and provide with the town manager's guidance. Um, I, I would still like to see more specifics in terms of the permitting, streamlining and zoning, what businesses are really looking for. That would really help us to hone into what we can start working and improving right away. Mm -hmm. And the last piece that I was thinking, since we are all going to have to work together, think out of the box, is whether one of the things that came out of the survey is the rents. And if you've had an opportunity to speak with landlords and what is the sense you're getting from speaking with the landlords with respect to rents and how they can also work with the businesses right now. Mm -hmm. Either Gabriella or uh, Claudia, any comments on that at this time? Uh, in terms of specificity, uh, Shalini, we, we look forward to bringing that to either the CRC or uh, whoever you direct us to, Paul and Lynn. Um, we just didn't bring that to this because we'd be here all night. Um, in terms of speaking with the landlords, um, there are a lot of conversations going on with, um, so uh, this is where Claudia and I differ. Um, technically, Claudia works for the businesses. Um, I say that I work for the <laughs> landlords, but I work with the businesses. Um, so I probably have more conversations with the landlords than Claudia does. Um, but trust me, I have, I have used terrible low numbers and um, they are frightening and, and um, they're not what anybody thought they'd be going to after the economic success over the past decade. Um, but it is on the radar and it is known. Yes. And some will and some will not. Well, I, I want to make sure that Claudia is still with us. I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just feel like um, those are such good insights and we don't have all those we didn't again we didn't bring all those details with the meeting but we have them and we will we decided that we thought this would be plenty to start with and for everyone to sort of um, you know just start to ruminate over and then we we bring in the details um but the details are going to be as important and uh you know we have had lengthy conversations about what permitting could look like downtown to ease you know to ease getting our restaurants as quickly as possible up online. Can we do a quick fact sheet for you know, quick permitting? Can we do a fast track permitting type of thing? You know, we've had amazing, numerous ideas on how that could look um, and what form that could take. 
again, to make it as easy as possible for them to be as flexible as possible when the day comes, um, even to the point of, you know, shutting down a certain portion of the town on, on the weekends um, so that people can can go to their favorite restaurants and, and go and stay for a while. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a much bigger discussion um, and how that looks and, and plays out. Um, and also with the landlords, I'll leave that with Gabrielle's comments. I think we're just right on that, you know, it's going to be a divide, but I think um, it's, it is going to take all of us to make this work and to be as adaptable as possible, especially early on. Melissa? Thank you. Here. I ask because my connection's been going in and out. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Mm, we're not hearing you, Alyssa. Wonderful. Um, oh, she just went out. <laughs> I'm going to try again. Does that sound? Go ahead and try. We're getting it. It's going in and out with an echo. I'm hearing that at your end too. And it says my connection's unstable, even though I have full bars and I'm sitting in one spot. I don't know. I'm pretty solid right now. So go ahead, please. So quickly, I just want to say in contrast to an earlier statement by one of my colleagues, I just want to make it clear that neither the town council nor I am convinced yet that it's financially smart to own Oh. at large would agree it was smart once they see the full details of the cost to do that if we turn down the MBLC grant so that's another thing in process that's been made and the other thing I wanted to just compliment um, in addition to all the other compliments to the bid in chamber is oh, we're missing the good part <laughs> we wanted to hear it <laughs> um Athena, could you please work with Alyssa so that she could come back and we could hear her full statement? Okay. And meantime, I'm going to take Dorothy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about, sometimes we talk about what we want people to do. And I want to talk about what people want to do. And when it comes to the businesses downtown, People want to, many people want to take a car, quickly park and dash in because it's in, when you compare it to the ease of online shopping, um, if it's not easy or convenient, many of us are saying, am I really going to go to a parking garage and park there and then walk five blocks to go to a store and check out something? And I, I don't think so. So I, and I think that parking is really key to an active downtown. So I want to say that we've got a couple of things going which are working in the wrong direction. And I think this is a time for us to rethink it. Our, our present parking zoning saying that people don't need to park downtown because there's a bus. I find an idea that is a coercive idea of what you want people to do. Um, but I'm, you know, public transportation is going to have a hard time for a couple of years until COVID-19 is gone, gone, gone. And we hear it's going to be coming back and back. So it's, this is a problem for New York City, a major one, and it's a problem for Amherst too. So what is the safest thing in Amherst? Walking, riding a bike, or driving your own private vehicle. So, um, and I'm not against a parking garage. I can see a need for parking garages, particularly for uh, Amherst Cinema or for other draws. I like the ideas of closing streets on a more frequent basis. That's one of your ideas. I think that's excellent and will allow us to um, interact with a sense of more social distancing. But just want to remind you, don't forget older people. We're a very large part of the year-round demographic. And when you think of Amherst as a um, survival town, yeah, that's true. After 9-11, many, many people, including me, left New York City, and I moved to Norfolk, Connecticut. And I see that in Amherst, there are so many New York roots here, and um, there will continue to be people from the big cities uh, to our south and to our east. Um, and many of the people who come will be older people who want easy and convenient parking. So I don't want to give that away. And I'd like, if there are buildings that are built, I don't like the idea of them not being told you don't need to include parking for your tenants because that can be done in a very quiet way underneath or in back. 
so that we don't have, you know, so we don't look at big parking lots as we drive through town. Um, I, I like your research. It's kind of, uh, if I had my classes in person instead of on Zoom, I'd say, hey, look at this report that John P uh, Page did. This is what, if you're, as a young person, you're expected to do when you get hired. It's pretty overwhelming. But um, one thing I would like is if you would do a color key, I have trouble telling the different colors apart. So when I look at the graph and see the percentages and I look at the little key, I can't match them necessarily. And I'm not colorblind, but there were so many different ch changes of, uh, of brown, for example. I got very confused. But I think there's a lot of fabulous research and evidence there. And I, uh, I commend all the work that uh, both the bid and the chamber are doing on uh, trying to keep our active, friendly, um, financially successful, or to restart it again downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Schreiber. Hi. Um, I wish that I could have heard what Elisa was saying because she mentioned MBLC. So I think she was talking about the libraries, but that's what I wanted to talk about also. Just um, one of the great, there's many tragedies in that we, in this, during this pandemic. And for one of the most powerful ones are the closings of the libraries. So Massachusetts is where the idea of the public library started. And the idea that that particular institution so important to Massachusetts would be, you know, closed is, you know, is profound. And it really is a huge cultural divide between those who have options and those who don't. So like it, a lot of people depend on the library for shelter or for, you know, to stay out of the out of the weather, but also to access Wi-Fi, to access information. It's hard for me to imagine, you know, sort of rebuilding after this pandemic and accepting the Jones Library the way it is. So, you know, to me, we have this amazing opportunity to rethink the Jones, and I hope that the architects of the Jones and, um, and the trustees of the Jones look, take another look at the scheme in the post-pandemic era but I think that the opportunity for social distancing and the kinds of things that we really need in our public spaces can happen in this critical um, public building right in the heart of downtown. And I hope we seize this opportunity and provide a place for, you know, for everyone using the knowledge of now this new criterion of, of, of a um, pandemic. Okay, Alyssa, have you been able to reconnect? If you can hear me, yes. If you can't we, hear me, then the answer is no. We can hear you. Would you please go ahead and start from the beginning? Thank you. Let me try this again. The two comments I just wanted to make, and for a change, they're not questions, but I just wanted to, to clarify. One is... Yes, we had the listening sessions about the capital projects, but I'm certainly not convinced it's financially smart to only repair the Jones Library and don't believe the community at large would agree it was smart once they see the full details of the cost to do so if we turn down the MBLC grant. So I don't want anybody listening to this session think that's a done deal. And the other is that I'm very excited that you, the Chamber and Bid talked about working with Mayor LaChapelle who, as they indicated, was appointed to the Governor's Reopening Advisory Board because it's so rare that we get Western Massachusetts representation on anything, that it's great. Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Are there any other comments at this time? So I wanna thank you again, uh, Claudia and um, Gabrielle, as well as John Page and the other people that have been very much a part of this whole effort um, your research is critical to Amherst. Understanding the businesses as you do at this point is critical to Amherst. And we are delighted and pleased to have this kind of partnership at this point in our history as we move forward. And we'll look forward to figuring out where we go with specific things as we map through this. So thank you. Paul, I believe you're up next. Thank you. And Sean's going to put up our slides. And my report is because we spent a lot of time on a piece of our report, mine will be relatively quick. quick. Um, so um, we'll get to the slide quickly, but I'm going to just start because uh, you're probably familiar with what the slides look like. Um, 
the our numbers in Massachusetts, 69,087 total cases, um, 563 in, in Hampshire County, 57 in Amherst, uh, 4,090 deaths statewide, 324,268 people tested. Um, I will go through the, you know, we usually give, I want to, I always feel it's uh, important to give you a uh, update on our staffing. Staffing continues to be strong. Um, we continue to test um, members of our staff who've been exposed or may have been exposed either on the job or not on the job. Uh, and, so, and we have a very good protocol between our police and fire uh, on that moving forward. Um, keep going, Sean. Uh, we'll get to major challenges because I'm we're going to be going through this because I want to get to a couple things. Here we are. Um, so I wanted to, we already talked about local businesses and that's one of the things that is highlighted here. The other thing that we really are going to be talking about and having listening deeply to what the university and the colleges are saying um, is what it's going to look like when the fall comes and they control their destinies. They have not made any decisions from our conversations with them. But I think for all each of them, um, they it will be different than it has been in the past. Um, we don't know how many people will be. We if they open, we don't know how many people will be on campus. We don't know how if people will be confined to campus. Um, we don't know how many people will be off campus. So there's all kinds of scenarios being and models being play, rolled out by the, the colleges and the university. Uh, we've asked them to keep us in the loop as they start to, to, to um, play these out. It's important for us for a number of different reasons, everything from water and sewer usage to the impact on our downtown. Um, and um, so once they get up and running, and, and again, I think for a lot of them, until there's an actual vaccine, um, that's going to be the, the difference maker. But everybody says we will not have a vaccine for a year to a year and a half. So we're going to be looking at a new reality come the fall, and uh, that will have a dramatic impact on all of our business in town, including the rental market. But we don't really know which way it's going to go. So you can go, go to the next slide, Sean. So this is where we talk about the things that are coming up uh, in terms of uh, communication. So we have our, uh, our website, obviously. Our call-in shows will be tomorrow at noon. I'll be with Assistant Town Manager Dave Zomek. Uh, we will be specifically talking about recreation areas, hiking trails, uh, Puffer's Pond. We're prepared for all those areas. Uh, if anybody would like to call in or send us a question in advance, uh, we will answer them. And we also record these and put them on our website. So if you can't make it right at noon, you can uh, watch another time. They last between 20 to 30 minutes. We don't want them to be super long. Um, so this is these are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. On Thursdays, it's always with our health director, Julie Fetterman. Uh, this Friday, um, we have a cup of Joe with Paul, which is in the morning at 8 a.m. for an hour, roughly. Uh, the special guest uh, on this day is Tony Morales, who's uh, the director of community relations at the University of Massachusetts. It happens to be commencement day for UMass. They will be having a virtual commencement with a lot of surprises, they say. That's, uh, we'll be streaming live at 4.30 on that Friday, um, May 8th. So uh, if people, again, that's, a, that's an opportunity for people to, to ask questions live. Um, you sort of do like tonight, you, you raise your hand through Zoom. We, had come, we invite you into the room. You can ask your question. We can have a dialogue, a little bit more informal than a lot of the than council meetings in a way that's purposely so. So um, please join us for any of those opportunities. Um, next slide. So the, the, these are all the things that are coming up. The major thing that we are working on right now is a presentation to the town council, the school committee, and the uh, Board of Library Trustees on Monday, May 11th at 5.30, working with our interim finance director to put together a presentation that will show you actual numbers and what it looks like for us for this fiscal year and for FY21, where we think the revenues are going to go and where we think the impacts are going to be, and then also identify some of the tools we have at our disposal to help us manage through this um, there are a lot of assumptions, a lot of uh, modeling that will go that we need to do. We're, we're just beginning to look at this in terms of is and some assumptions that will be built in and we'll ask, offer that up to you and you can give us some guidance on that as well in terms of whether 
this is a one-year deal, a two-year deal, a three-year deal. When do we think we're going to be back to um, being normal, whatever that will mean going forward? Um, next slide. So I, I note that our health director, Julie Fetterman, is here, but I want to point two things out to you. Next slide. Um, two significant orders from the governor this year, uh, I mean, this week. Um, one was his uh, order to extend the closing of except for essential businesses and to limit gatherings to no more than 10 people. He extended that order until May 18th, uh, which is two weeks from, or that's, yes, two weeks from tonight. Um, so, and as part and parcel of that, he had um, established the reopening committee that has three members of the, of the um, municipalities on it, the mayor of East Hampton, the mayor of Lawrence, and the chief of staff for the city of Boston. Uh, there are also a lot of industry representatives on that committee, and uh, they've been very active. They're on meetings, you know, five, six, seven hours a day, meeting with different different groups, listening, and then their idea is to come up with some principles for reopening. Um, I've, I'm on two different groups, um, one for the MMA, a small group of about 10 managers and mayors who are helping to advise our, to shape the MMA's thinking on this thing. And then there's also a group of, um, a very large group of uh, managers and mayors that meets weekly on Sundays. Uh, that we, are, we talk about many of these same issues. So there's a million conversations going around, on around about this um, and welcome any ideas that you may have. The second one is the um, his order about face coverings in public places where social distancing is not possible. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so, and Julie can speak to this if she wants, or there may, she may just respond to questions based on it. So the order is that if you are in, if you're over two years old, um, if you are inside or outside and you cannot social distance uh, in a public place, um, you must cover your mouth and your nose. Um, you, there are, there's an exemption if you have a medical condition. There is no requirement for you to carry a certificate to prove your medical condition. But if you have a, a, a certain, any kind of emphysema, I don't know what the medical, medical conditions would be. Julie could speculate. I'm terrible on medical stuff, so um, won't even try. Um, this applies to employees who work in an establishment as well. Um, if you are on public transportation, you're required to have a, a face covering. Uh, and then there's a, th a $300 fine that's attached to this, but it's totally up to the local um, jurisdiction to um, enforce these things. Our approach has been to do um, education, encourage people to do it. Um, it's really just for the obstinate um, people who really want to, um, you know, don't want to cooperate where a fine would ever come into play. I haven't really heard of any, but any community issuing fines at this moment in time. Um, so, uh, and then I'm going to end, if you want to go to the next slide, um, and the next slide after. So we already had the, this, so we, we've talked a lot about resilience and resilient Amherst, and it's something that we've sort of tagged ourselves with. Uh, it's our ability to recover from or a misfortune or change. And that's what we're talking about. We are going to be resilient. We have the capacity if we make smart decisions and that's our mission. The way we make smart decisions is by having a lot of communication among interested parties. And that's why you hear us talking about meeting weekly with a lot of different groups to make sure communication is strong. And next slide. And so one of the things that this, one of my groups that we've been talking about, we, we talk about what does, what does this look like? What are the principles that we want to observe when we go to a reopening? And we want all our decisions, and this is something that uh, Julie has held us very uh, strongly to accountable um, in Amherst, is that we want whatever our decisions are to be grounded in science and most recent research. Um, we want any kind of... Um, reopening or plan to be coordinated and regional. It doesn't make any sense for Amherst to move in one direction, to Hadley move into a second direction, and to Northampton to move in a third direction. Um, it's important for the state to articulate guidelines so that there aren't, there isn't a mishmash. And I, we, I think we saw this a little bit with face masks, where different towns had different rules, and you could be 
within 15 minutes of four different towns around Boston, and each one had a different rule about face face masks and face coverings. So we are, we appreciate um, that the governor has come out explicitly and said, here's what we think everyone should do. It makes it clear to the population. Uh, we want anything like this to be equitable. We want to make sure that there are no party that every every par party has um, access to the capital and to the things that they need to re to return their business to normal, to return themselves to getting um, back on back on their feet. And again, basic, we want to prioritize our decision making on health and welfare of our population. We often will, as we're struggling with different issues, and there's a lot of issues that we talk about internally, and we often have to reorient ourselves and say, what is in the interest of the public health? What is the interest of the public safety for the people of Amherst? And we're always reframing ourselves and um, re recalibrating ourselves to say that is our mission as public officials paid for by the employee, by the um, people of Amherst. That's what our mission is. And so it's, it's always a really good grounding tool for us to be focused on those things. And I think, Julie, I'm not sure if you want to say something or if you just want to respond to questions. You're muted. Julie, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Paul, I think very well said. And since we've been going on for some time here, I think um, it'll probably be best for me to just answer questions. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Melissa Brewer. And we're going to see if you can hear her ask it. Yes. Thank um, you. We can. Thank you. I'm concerned about the way the governor's order is being characterized. The way I read the part about not distance, being able to distance six feet, but the next paragraph says, all persons are required to wear masks or cloth face coverings at all time when inside grocery stores, pharmacies, and other retail stores. And then also talks about public transportation like Paul talked about. So that's not an if you can't be six feet apart, that is saying you will do it, right? Um, Alyssa, uh, yes, when you're inside, the idea is to be wearing a mask. I think the piece where if you can be six feet apart or further, you don't have to wear a mask is if you're outside and there's no one around you or you're, you know, well over six feet away from someone else, then you don't have to wear a mask. You know, there, there have been some areas around the country where the concept has been the minute you go out your door, you put on a mask. So I do think that the difference here is just that um, while it is based on the six foot away, when you're inside in a public space, you're just going to have a mask on. Whereas if you're outside, you're supposed to be using your good judgment about that six foot boundary. Thank you. I think that's very clear. Okay. Mindy Jo? Yes, I, I want to follow up on that, um, especially the outdoor portion. Um, there has been a lot of use of the rail trail, um, including by myself and my family, because we happen to live nearby and we can walk there. Um, I have seen very few masks being worn on the rail trail, despite its heavy use and the need to pass people and bikes passing in the middle of the lane while people are walking on each side. Um, and you just know there's not six feet distance because it's just not a large area. So I, I would like um, Julie to offer some guidance regarding the governor's policy, the order that he just issued about mandatory mask wearing when you can't necessarily be six feet away and how that actually might look or play out on say a rail trail or at a public park or at our local trails at Amethyst Brook and those locations. I think you bring up something really important, Mandy Jo, and we're having our internal discussions about this. Certainly the rail trail is a very specific spot because it's we know that it's very crowded, that, people, that if you're gonna pass each other, there's not gonna be six foot distancing. Um, so we don't have a conclusion yet about how we're gonna get the education out to people that if you're gonna be going to certain places, like if you're gonna be going outside, but it's to a narrow place like a trail, or 
a park that could have a lot of people there or, or has a narrow entrance or the rail trail specifically, which by definition is narrow, then you're going to have a mask with you and there's a good chance you're gonna to need to wear it because of the way you pass people. Um, so we're still looking at how we're going to educate people about that. I think, I think the governor actually addressed that because one of the examples he used is when he goes outside his home at 5.30 in the morning and there's a, a, a jogger or run, someone running, he doesn't think that person would need to wear a mask. But if he goes out outside his house at 5.30 in the evening, there are a lot of people out there. Then that runner needs to wear a mask. So that's not a clear definition. But if you're going to be outside exercising or doing what, biking or whatever, and you're going to be passing someone, that's my, well, again, we're having this conversation, so I'm probably going out and it, on the, before um, Julie would say, but, you know, that's when you expect people to be wearing something to delay the uh, stuff coming out of your mouth, basically. Sean? Um, do we have a sense uh, about testing? How is that starting to become more available? Is What is the trend with respect to testing? And the second question was about LSSE camps. Do we have a sense of what's happening with the summer camps? Thank you. Two good questions. So in terms of testing, um, there's no indication that we have a particular large increase in testing availability. I think one of the ways we would be able to measure that would be by the opening up of drive-through locations for testing, um, things like that. So we do not specifically have more testing available. I think that that's something that just continues to evolve. Um, in terms of leisure services camps and all camps, <clears throat> this is certainly one of the really, really big questions. So twice a week, I'm on a call with all other local public health folks um, with the Department of Public Health at the state. And um, of course, as the warm weather is coming, all these warm weather topics are coming up, camps, pools. Um, we're expecting guidance fairly close to May 18th because all of this will be connected to how is Massachusetts doing? What are we seeing happening in our hospitals? What are we seeing in terms of people, um, death rates? What are we seeing in terms of a trend downwards? So I think summer camps are linked a little bit to the conversations about childcare and, and um, people getting people back to work. So while it's really important for kids to have something to do, camps are off, often also part of that piece of helping people to get back at work. So what I'm hearing is that we're not going to know about that for, you know, maybe 10 days or so, because we're really seeing in real time what's happening. So and I, just to add on to that, the um, again, a, a, that's a common topic for municipal officials saying that if you're going to open your pool, we or if you're going to keep your pool closed, does that mean everybody's going to come to my community if we open our pool? It needs to be coordinated and, and regional in terms of the approach. Dorothy? Okay, can, am I on? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I wanted to, uh, two points. I wanted to add to the masks. You don't have to be on a hiking trail. You just have to live near a sidewalk. I live on Amity Street. Very well-traveled sidewalk and people should be wearing masks all the time. There's very difficult. You don't have time to get your six foot distance and people are passing each other within uh, two feet all the time. Um, so I, I really think we have to be more clear cut on the masks. Um, about the leisure services camps, I hope that some of the camps are preparing to go online, even though that's not what you necessarily think of uh, as a summer activity. But I know that my granddaughter's, one of her camps uh, at Damers College, a great books is going online. They're not gonna have their schools. Right now, the kids are going doing their lessons from their schools a certain number of hours a day, but they can't just go into a void of activity for the summer. So there, I, I just hope that there is some uh, online children's activity. And you know, there could be a lot of wonderful things that could be done online um, that the leisure services will provide in the summer, whether or not they can do outside stuff. Thank you for that, Dorothy. I, I um, yeah, I, I was not, I was referencing 
you know, camps in person, camps that are outside. So, and I don't know if Paul knows if, if Leisure Services is looking at anything virtual. I don't know myself. They are. Great, great, very good. Right. Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so um, we're at the very beginning of what I call free couch season, where free couch season, okay. where people uh, <laughs> move out of their apartments and don't know what to do with the couch and put it on the front you know, on the curb with a free sign on it. So in most years that's benign. So this year it doesn't seem particularly benign. I'm just curious if you've thought about, yeah, um, that we saw you, you know, thought about that at all. Okay. It's a good point. We haven't had an explicit conversation about that, Julie. Yeah, I was gonna say, no, Steve, I'm glad you brought it up yeah. because so many years, definitely I would be thinking about that. We'd all be talking about it and, um, no. So thanks for that reminder. And I think we should look at that and talk with the schools. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more hands. And although I hate to prolong the meeting, I would like to suggest a five minute break and we will be back at 8.05.
come back, please um, put yourself back on camera so I know who's back. Thanks. Um, Lynn, could I ask a question? Yes. What was the date of the Cup of Joe? I want to send this message. It's, it's on the 8th. The 8th. It's Friday. Friday, that's what I'm saying. 9 o'clock. I have 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, I'm sorry. It's yeah. 8 o'clock. Friday, and that Friday is May what? 8th. 8th, okay, great, thank you. It's at 8 o'clock, and the information is on the website. I'm trying, I'm trying to text somebody. <laughs> okay. Okay. Paul, anything else on that? Okay. Um, it is 8.05. I'm going to quickly make sure you're back and reconnected. Um, Shalini Balmilne? Not yet. Alyssa Brewer? Present. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. And Shalini Balmilne. Shalini? All right. Okay, we're going to move on to our actions items. The first action item is agenda. Um, and I will read the whole motion. And then as I've mentioned in the past, you need to indicate after I complete that as to whether or not you would like an item removed from the consent agenda onto the regular full agenda. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed. When the president lists the consent agenda items, the request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. The motion is to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 7B, authorization of town manager to enter intermunicipal agreements. 7C, referral of reservation of public ways, parking and street closure, long-term request, Amherst Farmers Market, Town Services, and Outreach Committee. Referral to permanent use of public ways, 133 and 143 Southeast Street Town Services and Outreach Committee. Referral of surveillance technology bylaw, Town Services and Outreach Committee and Automatic Referral to G Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. The next, the need to waive Council Rule 8.6 is not necessary because the uh, TSO has provided a written report. So that is not part of the consent agenda. 8B, approval of Town Manager appointment of Town Council to Energy and Climate Action Committee and 10A, approval of minutes, April 27th, 2020, regular town council meeting minutes. I'm going to pause and Alyssa Brewer. Please remove the farmer's market from the consent agenda. Okay. And Pat DeAngelis. Please remove the inner uh, municipal agreement. Okay. And uh, Kathy Shane. Please remove the permanent use of the public way at 133-143 Southeast Street. Okay. So the motion that I need a second on is to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 
referral of surveillance technology bylaw, town services and outreach committee and automatic referral to governance organization and legislation committee and the approval of town manager appointment of town counselor to energy and climate action committee and the approval of minutes April 27, 2020 regular town council meeting minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Does we require a roll call vote? Is there any further question? Okay, then we will do the roll call vote. This time we will start with Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Aye. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. Uh, George Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Aye. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. And Shalini Balmilm. Yes. All right. The consent agenda as we amended it passed unanimously 1300 with no one absent. So we're starting with the intermunicipal agreements. And uh, this is something that has come before the council once before. Pat, you asked that it be removed. Do you have a specific question? Uh, yes, I. Uh, it's the same question I brought up last week when it was on the agenda. Uh, in the Hadley uh, water agreement, there is uh, missing information in terms of fees. Um, I'm trying to see in my notes what the number is, but I think, and I asked that that be looked into and it's still there as a, a series of question marks in the agreement. Mr. Bachman? Yes, so we have not set those fees yet. And these are, uh, the specifics of the agreement are, something that we are continuing to work on the question before the council is if you would allow us to enter into our intermunicipal agreement with the town of hadley or not um and, and because it, these are this agreement is still being worked on thank you okay so the motion is to authorize the town are there any other questions okay the motion is to authorize the town manager to enter into intermunicipal agreements under Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 4A, as outlined in the Town Manager Memorandum to the Town Council dated 424 2020 for the following purposes. South Deerfield Water Supply District Water Agreement through December 31st, 2022. Town of Hadley Water Agreement through December 31st, 2020. And Town of Hadley Wastewater Agreement through December 31st, 2020. Any further, is there a second? I think those- Mandy. Yes, Mandy. Yes, okay. Paul, did you have a comment? I think the agreements are through 2022, all three. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say the wrong date? Mm -hmm. I, it's written as 2022 on our motions. I must mm -hmm. have gotten it right, thank you. And so the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Andy Steinberg. Yeah, I was just curious if we uh, don't have a complete agreement with one of the, uh, for one of the agreements, Hadley, um, can't uh, complete an agreement without it uh, having been fully negotiated, I would assume. What is the um, need to have a vote on that particular agreement today as opposed to the subsequent meeting? Mr. Bachman. So I think, well, my understanding is that you have to authorize me to enter into an agreement and then it's up to the executive to negotiate the, the terms of the agreement. Um, it's not up to the council to negotiate the terms of the agreement, but if you would like to reserve your action until after the final agreement is negotiated, that's up to you, that's up to the council. And so this would be removing which one from the uh, motion? The water? And do you ask, Alyssa, you have your hand up. 
Yes, thank you. Just following up on what Andy said, um, we had this conversation before and you know that Paul and I disagree about the nuance of this. And of course, it would be possible for us to say, sure, town manager, just go ahead and negotiate an agreement. I just don't think that's what our community wants us to do. So given if it's not time sensitive, I would prefer not to have the one with the question marks approved at this time. Okay, so would you please make the motion as you want it modified? I'm sorry, we have a motion on the floor. Is there an amendment to the motion? Mandy Jo. So I'm not going to move to amend because I think we have the right to approve this now. I would vote against any amendment to remove the Hadley Water one from it. We are the legislature. We are not the executive. We are not the people that negotiate the contract. Um, I want to remind this council that for the community choice aggregation motions that we faced a couple months ago, we gave our town manager the authority to negotiate those intermunicipal agreements without having any clue what they're actually going to look like. We didn't even have a draft in front of us, yet we passed that motion. I think it was overwhelmingly. I don't know what the exact um, vote was, but it was, but it passed without having seen a draft at all. This is something that Paul is perfectly within the right to ask us to do. Um, so I won't, I, I'm gonna vote for all three to authorize him to do that. We've done it before with even less information than we have now. I don't see any reason to delay this any further. Okay. The motion has been made and seconded. Is there any other discussion at this time? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to do a roll call vote. Uh, this time starting with Pat DeAngelis. A vote in favor. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer. Yes. Uh, Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Chalini Balnum. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. No. The vote is 13, I mean 12 to one, zero abstained no absences. We're moving on then to the reservation of the public way regarding parking and street closure long-term request. Uh, this is regarding the Amherst Farmers Market. And because there was a significant amount of interest in this, we're going to begin with a presentation of the proposal um, by Mr. Bachman. But let me just preface this by saying the following. This is a request by Amherst, Amherst's very popular farmer's market uh, for the use of the public way on Saturdays during the coming months. And that is why it has come to the council. What makes it different from other years are the present and future conditions that define the new normal because of COVID. In many ways, this is also the first proposal to come before the council relating to the reopening of Amherst under the definition of the new normal. The proposal includes the many state guidelines for general health and safety, as well as specific guidelines for farmers markets. And these have been developed by health and safety experts. One of those that is not in here because it was not submitted at the time that it was there was that regarding the masks. We have placed, we have, have places the proposed in PowerPoint form and are also able to project the proposed layout. Our goal tonight is to collect questions and statements that will be forwarded to TSO. TSO will either meet on May 11th or May 18th to at least begin to address our concerns. If they are able to complete their inner, their review by April, by I'm sorry, by May 18, this will return to the council at our meeting that evening for action regarding the present and or revised request. Given the challenges of the Zoom meetings, Mr. Bachman will make a presentation 
Present with us this evening are Farmers Market Manager David Mikowski and the Head of the Market John Spinetti. But Paul, please proceed. So thank you. Um, uh, one of the big harbingers of spring in Amherst has always been the farmer's market, but this year it's different. Um, as Lynn mentioned, this is the first time that we will be talking about the council or the town officially taking an action that would open up the town in some ways um, after the May 18th, assuming that the, so whatever happens after May 18th. Um, Again, we have present and participating, if, if you would like to hear from them, uh, the market manager, Dave Machowski, and our long-term member, John Spinetti, who has, I think, maybe the longest uh, serving uh, farmer attending a farmer's market in the country. He's been here since the late 70s uh, every week. So great. thanks for being here, John. Um, the the uh, under the governor's order, farmers markets are considered an essential business, so they are permitted to to operate. Um, the goal of tonight is to present to present the application at the same site as at the location has always been, but in, introducing uh, social distancing standards so that the uh, off the um, the farmers market could open effectively. Uh, we assisted the farmers market staff assisted the farmers market by putting down, uh, creating a plan based on their sort of sketch that they did. So that was a presentable plan that you could actually review, and by coming up with some standards that we thought uh, would um, allow them to open at their current um, current location. One of the things that we considered as we were building this was whether this is a social, this is not a social gathering. It's a way to purchase food in an outdoor space, much like you would go to a grocery store, but in an outdoor space, as long as social distancing was, was impl implemented. Um, one of the things that we had envisioned was that as you do a plan, there may be things that change once you open up and you learn from it. For, for instance, I went to the Greenfield Farmer's Market on Saturday and they had sort of, they said they had a little rocky start at the beginning and then they changed some things around as they learned how people were going to be standing in together and they adjusted it by 10 o'clock. They were all up and running, but they had to make some changes on the fly, but it was very intense. A lot of staff supporting it. There were eight stalls there, um, but, it, but it got started. So next slide. In your packet is was, was a cover memo that I drafted. It's a the plan as dated April 25th that we we prepared based on uh, some conversations with the farmers market. The original application form, the farmers market usually comes in much earlier uh, than this, and so because of we didn't know where we were going with the whole COVID thing, we, it's bringing being brought to you today. And then the number of state directives that have come out. Um, next slide. We structured it based on the request of the market to, to, to accommodate the 32 vendors that they typically have on a, on a weekly basis. Um, the, the idea was to maintain their 10 by 10 um, tent sites that where each uh, vendor would be and, and provide a basic amount of uh, social distancing between them. Uh, in order to do that, we, we created three different rows instead of two. Um, and then also extended some way down Boltwood Avenue in both directions. Next slide. Um, we've, um, there are other ways that uh, the farmer's market, we could re-explore this uh, at the council's pleasure uh, in, in terms of expanding the footprint, looking at Main Street, uh, looking at the common, looking at other locations. Um, the farmer's market feels, and they can speak to this themselves, that being in this location downtown, or at least on the common, in the common area at a visible site is a high priority for them. Um, I won't go into the logistics, but there would be one entry point. The market would be fenced off, so you could, there would only be one entrance and one exit, so that there was proper social distancing. When people queued up, they would be six feet between each person in line. Um, and we would want to have them make sure they everything was set up and, and, and um, inspected before they were able to open. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that was important that's been a standard is that there'd be plexiglass or some other material that uh, would protect the vendors from the customers and vice versa, that transactions would happen uh, in a 
um, hands-off way, much like um, and and that the um, the the transactions would be handed off in a in a, um, in a hands-off way, and that uh, people would not be touching the produce; they would be handed the produce. Um, there's the farmers market is preparing, and I'm not sure if it's they can David Bachowski can address this. They are preparing a virtual farmers market so that you can go online, visit the farmers pick the produce that you would like, and then have a pickup zone uh, on South Pleasant Street is what we have proposed, um, where you could pick up your food and have contactless um, pickup of, of food. Next slide. Um, there would be uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer before you entered the market. Everyone would be expected to wash their hands before entering the market. There'd be portable uh, toilets um, and available for uh, people who are there or for the vendors um, that we would that, that we would view this as a food or essential um, farm services to support the local agriculture industry and not necessarily a crafts fair or something like that um, and this is these are our the, the farmers market may be recommending something different um, to be clear that there would be, have to be social distancing which which is defined as six feet separation and um and go to the next slide and with the governor's new order everyone would be required to wear a face covering if they were to enter or work at the farmer's market uh, we would not be promoting live music or anything that would encourage uh, social interaction or, or social um, gathering um, again reusable bags like at most of our grocery stores are not allowed um, we had suggested that the first hour or so of the market be dedicated to those over 60 years old and that the building commissioner establish a maximum load, meaning the number, the maximum number of people who would be allowed into the market at any one time, and that would be counted and enforced. Uh, for all of these things, we, town staff, our inspectors would be uh, monitoring and enforcing, especially at the beginning, to make sure that all the, all that the, whatever provisions the council decides to put on are enforced. But in addition, we recognize that the building inspector and the health inspector have a different set of rules that they will also be looking at and enforcing on their own. So the council, and we will go to the strictest rule, whoever sets the strictest rule on these things. So with that, um, Lynn, if I, I could ask either David or John, if they'd like to say a few words. Um, Paul, I have a few words and I'm, I'm here. I think John is here also still, no? Yes. So this is David Machowski, yep, the farmer's market Dave, manager speaking. This is David Mahowski. And I want to thank Mahowski. you, Paul, and everybody for just giving us some airtime tonight. Um, Paul, I think that was really well put. I don't have much to add, but I do have a couple points to go further with what you had said. Um, first of all, just regards to John, I believe he is the oldest attendee at a farmer's market, if not in the state, maybe the country too. Um, the market started in 1972. John was there on day one, from my understanding. So he has been around and seen it all for many years and watched it grow and really kind of provide a, uh, a hub for agricultural commerce in the center of Amherst, which has been great. Um, you had mentioned that we are essentially setting up an outdoor farmer's market and I think it's a, or an outdoor grocery store. I think that's a good analogy. Um, I think it's fair to say that we could maintain a lot of the same protocol as the grocery stores are managing just we won't have a roof but we could provide the distancing and the spacing and everything to appropriately accommodate the covid restrictions and make sure that everybody's safe both shoppers and vendors alike which uh, i think we all agree are very important points at this stage um i think that the populace right now is kind of champing at the bit to get back out there and like you said the market is a harbinger of spring and we are dealing with people that are have been cooped up, and we are also uh, a provision for people that are dealing with food insecurities. So, the market is a way for those that, uh, for those particularly that are in the center of town and on foot, a way that they can shop, get things that they need, and be able to zing back home. And we also have a um, a fund that we're providing a uh, a supplement for those that are. Um, in a position of food insecurity that are using EBT that we offer a, uh, a supplement to them monthly for use specifically at the farmer's market for fresh produce and meats, et cetera. Um, so I, I would love to see that um, availed by getting back out there for those people that are in need. 
the uh, the market historically has been a class A farmers market. So the issue of crafts is really not something I think we're going to have to uh, jump in terms of many hurdles. Many of the vendors do have crafts alongside of their agricultural product, but it is an agriculturally based market. Almost every vendor to a name has agricultural products, things that are grown, things that are produced, meats, vegetables, fruits, produce, flowers, things that are produced out in the fields of the of the local area. So I don't know if we'll be exempting many people or excluding many people from, uh, from joining as vendors. Um, on a given day, historically, we average between 25 and 28 vendors per Saturday. We've got almost 40 registered, but they come through, you know, depending on seasonality. Some are there in the beginning, some are there at the end, some are... Are, are alternating they'll do once a month twice a month whatever it depends on what their product is and what their timing is so we uh, we try to accommodate all those vendors that are coming through when their product is ready and when their their season really is at their own high point if that makes sense um i think that this is going to be a challenge for sure i mean we're all kind of learning and having to adjust on the fly and i think your point of visiting the uh, the Greenfield Farmer's Market and seeing that they did have a little rocky start. Um, I think we're going to have that too. I think no matter when we get out there, we're going to be learning on the fly and we'll be able to accommodate the needs. But we will have to be uh, flexible, adaptable, and plan as best we can. But as you know, a plan is a plan, but the reality is the alternate plan. And we'll have to address that as it shows. Try to think ahead of all the possible things that might come up. But um, I think that day one of the market opening will be slightly different than day two and day two might be slightly different than day three and, and so on as we evolve with the, uh, the needs and the restrictions and how we're going to uh, make this a public service again for the people, but safely to do so, if that makes sense. John? You're on mute, John. Yes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank town manager for the presentation and his core team for helping us set up the, the plan that he, they that he detailed. I think David has covered most of the points I would have mentioned um, and more. And I want to just point out that a lot of our uh, food offerings to the uh, disadvantaged and people who are, are in need of locally grown good food, uh, safe food, I might add, uh, in, include the WIC program, include HIP program, Healthy Incentive Program, as well as the one that David mentioned that we received a grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield, $35,500. 80% of that grant goes directly in, in the form of food offerings uh, to the uh, people in need. Those people are the ones that are particularly in need based upon being eligible for SNAP. Um, it, it turns out that the people in that category do not have any other venues in order to buy the foodstuffs that we offer. Uh, and I want to emphasize the safety of the foods over the years, the fact that almost all of our foods are, in fact, organic and are, are produced by the farmers within the market exclusively. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity to, to speak to you and ask for uh, as much help as we can get. Thank you. May I just add one more point? Are we still live here? You, can you all hear yes, me? Yes, yes. Yes, you are. Um, Paul had mentioned the fact, I, you know, I, I think we can take this COVID situation as a slight opportunity for positive change, too. And it's kind of forced us into thinking about the idea of a virtual farmer's market. And what we're doing is setting up a an opportunity for the patrons to shop online for all of the market vendors to put their product up online and have that transaction entirely happening virtually. What we would hope to do is maybe in the meantime of establishing the fully regaled farmer's market is set up in the center of town just with the market tent as a drop-off and pickup point, contact-free drop-off and pickup point, so that all the vendors could have their produce and product ordered, pre-ordered on a Thursday or Friday could be dropped off on Saturday morning and then the customers could queue through and pick up their orders 
maybe something that is somewhat aligning with standard market operating hours or something like that, but a way that we can make a presence for the market, but without having any sort of aggregate of people or agglomeration of people in the center of town. So we're just trying to accommodate the needs of the market, needs of the town's folks, the needs of the people purchasing in a way that also works within the COVID restrictions for the short term before we get out there as a full physically regaled market again. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to start this conversation by first saying, I hope we can make this work. I hope we can make it work so that we, the town council, feel that we have created a safe and healthy environment in our public way. I do have some questions. I'm going to ask them at some point if others have not raised them. But let's start with uh, the people who have raised questions. And that first one is Andy Steinberg. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, of course, be voting in favor of the motion because it's to refer to a committee that is then going to come back to the council. Um, and I want them very much to have the conversation. There are two issues that I want to raise, however. One is that when I was first elected to the select board seven or eight years ago, um, I immediately became involved with the agricultural community's concern about the farmer's market and the fact that um, it was using town resource, an extremely valuable town resource, which we were gladly giving, but it was not um, favoring our local taxpayers who are farmers. And um, as a consequence, it was, uh, to the point where um, local growers were really being, and, and producers were being excluded to the favor of uh, businesses that were coming from outside of the community and were not taxpayers. And uh, I am concerned because it's holding the amount of uh, vendor um, capabilities to the same number and uh, uh, whether there's we're losing what I think had been a valuable conversation that was started at that time to try and do things to increase participation opportunities and to increase the opportunities on an equal basis with other vendors for our uh, local growers who pay taxes to the town. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue that um, I hope that the committee has a chance to look at is that uh, the rule or, or the proposal is to uh, suggest masks for um, our uh, participant, the people who are coming in as customers, but not to require it, only to require it of the vendors. Um, given the way that the pattern is working out, and the fact that some people would be stopping at booths that they are interested in and others may want to pass by, there's going to be a lot of people passing within six feet. And um, I would hope that uh, our uh, public health uh, folks, uh, including Julie, have an opportunity to reassess that question as to whether there really is six feet separation as we go through. So those are my two points. Thank you. I, I want to point out that the proposal was submitted before the state required masks with the six feet. Uh, just to be clear, of that that would be an automatic update to this proposal. Uh, Darcy. Yeah, um, I just was wondering, uh, since we collected questions from the counselors over the last couple of days, whether we're going to go through those questions tonight. That will be up in, up to each individual counselor that submitted questions as to whether they want to go through theirs, but they will also be willing to make them available in writing. Uh, okay, so um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, one is um, how the protocols are going to be monitored and how the town is going to monitor the monitoring 
Um, and um, secondly, um, I picture that there are certain um, vendors that are more popular than other vendors and that there will be kind of a backup or a line to visit certain vendors. And I wonder how that's going to be accommodated uh, when there's a number of people waiting to go, you know, if there's only one customer at a time at a tent, um, how that's going to work. May I, may I jump you. in? Uh, yes, although I, I think what we would really like to accomplish tonight is get all the questions out, mm -hmm. maybe have you answer a few of them, but then uh, really the big conversation will take place at the TSL meeting. Okay. okay. So hold on, David, there might, we'll come back. Alyssa. So I appreciate that this came off the consent calendar and I appreciate that the town council president solicited comments from the counselors directly to the town manager to see what could be incorporated into tonight's presentation, because I think we kind of lost sight of our timeline here. With the farmer's market trying to open, having it wait until May 18th for TSO to talk about it and then to talk about it town council at May 18th is literally a few days prior to when the farmer's market wants to open. And so trying to give them as much notice as possible, TSO has been willing to have a one hour meeting next week on the 11th. I realize that the night of the 11th at 5.30, there was no intention to do other town council business, but depending on where we get tonight, we might want to ask the town council to vote on the plan on the 11th rather than waiting until the 18th, simply so the farmer's market has more time to comply and as they as their thinking has evolved because of other things that they've been seeing done other places. So I, I think we need to think about that timing tonight before we get out of here so we all know what we're expecting. In terms of my questions that I asked, and I appreciate, Lynn, that you're saying, let's just get them all out because maybe some will be easy to answer and others will be more appropriate for TSO. And referring back to what Andy said, I mean, like I said, TSO doesn't have a lot of time to talk about this. We don't have weeks or hours even <laughs> to talk about it. So um, the first thing was the mask. I was disturbed that even though the governor's order wasn't out yet, that it wasn't already being promoted as a thing to do. But as Lynn said, that's an automatic update. That will happen. The vendors will all have to wear them and the customers will all have to wear them. And that's just that simple. That, there's no question there as to how that's going to work. Um, there is theoretically a question with the governor's order if the farmer's market would have to require it. But I'm saying the farmer's market has to require it for all shoppers. Um, the Another that was touched on briefly by Paul was the vendor restrooms. The way it was written in the proposal was that that might be required. He mentioned porta potties this time. I am adamant that there must be vendor restrooms unless it's strictly a pickup as David suggested might happen at the very beginning. Um, because vendors obviously used to use the Lord Jeff in at Boltwood bathrooms. That's obviously not going to be available to them. I don't care about public having restrooms. They can wait. <laughs> but, but for vendors, they need to have porta potties. And so that needs to be set up. And obviously, that takes just a little bit of time. Um, I appreciate what was explained about the scope of the vendors. I'm still a little unclear as to whether or not the normal crafters are also being included in this, in addition to the food. And I know David touched on that, but I, I somehow missed part of that. Um, the plexiglass barrier, I know we all argue over shall, should, will, and what all those words mean, but I think I heard Paul say there either will be a plexiglass barrier or something very similar to that, so I guess that's close enough. I'd like people to look at the parking spaces for the curbside pickup. I don't think two is sufficient. I think at this time, my family, for example, is ordering groceries at a huge premium because we have at-risk members of the household. I want to be able to tell people it's safe to go to this farmer's market. You can absolutely order online. You can pick it up. You don't have to go into a place to get it. And I love walking a block to the farmer's market, but that's not going to be feasible under this situation. So I'm thinking two spaces might not be enough. So I'd like us to relook at that. I'm sure town staff could help with that. Um, in the before the governor's order, the, the order that was put out by Monica Burrell associated with farmers markets made it clear that there were a variety of different ways you could give that visual to people about what the six feet distance means. Obviously, it's way harder to do it outside than it is inside a grocery store where you can put nice little labels on the 
You can't do that on the ground as easily. I'm saying use whatever marking spray paint you have to do that to make it clear. And I'd like to see more of a plan as to how that's going to work rather than just an assurance that it's going to work. So something that's just, you know, shown to us on a, on a piece of paper would be great. Um, I like the fact that it's now perhaps clearer to people that the touching of produce is just prohibited. It's not maybe, it's not shouldn't, it's, it, it's they just don't. People don't get to touch produce. Sorry, we're not in that world at this time. And the other part is just that once all these conditions are worked out, I'd like to see some sort of signed agreement between the town manager and the farmer's market, just so everyone's clear on what's a must and what's a might be. Because although, of course, we're going to have to adjust, especially if we start out with just the virtual market, I don't think it's at all realistic to say, well, we don't have to throw the porta potties the first week, or, well, we don't need to worry about the six foot markings as much the first week. Obviously, we need to worry about all those things from the very beginning. And I'd like to be able to encourage people to attend and participate in the farmer's market as quickly as possible, because I know that already the farmers are feeling behind. So thanks for your patience. Sarah Schwartz. So um, I would just like to um, thank right now Andy Steinberg, who did indeed um, speak up for many Amherst farmers and really help try to um, ease over and rectify a very uh, difficult situation that we had. And I thank him very much. Questions that I would have for the market and also for TSO as they are considering this. Um, so we talked about stations for alcohol, hand sanitizer, the plexiglass, fencing, um, a virtual market, and also extra town uh, staff, extra time for them. And so I'm just wondering, I think all those things are excellent and, and absolutely needed. Um, but I'm wondering, as we talk about this, who is going to be paying for these things? Will it be, will the town um, be helping to pay for some of these? Will it be completely on, on the market? Um, and then the other thing that I want to say is that having a premium space in the town of Amherst, in the center of Amherst, and really the town of Amherst giving their, their blessing to farmers. Um, now we're talking about perhaps a virtual market. I think every farmer in Amherst, especially ones who have um, farm stands, would very much wish that they could have this kind of help. Um, this is tremendous help for farmers right now during COVID-19. So I'm also hoping that there will be um, a discussion like Andy said about including other Amherst farmers, especially if, if the town of Amherst is going to support them so much. And again, I would, I'm, I would hope that, that Amherst would and Amherst always has, thanks. Uh, yes. Uh Alyssa, you're back up again. I'm sorry, that's a mistake. Okay, Mandy Jo Haneke. Thank you. Um, I will try to go through my questions quickly. Um, some of them have been covered, um, but I am concerned that what was presented to us were pretty much guidelines with a lot of shoulds and not very many shalls. Um, and the fact is, if we grant this as a town council, I kind of want some assurances that they will be shalls and that they must be followed. Um, so the way it's written now really concerns me about them just being guidelines instead of more like musts and shalls. Um, and that's in a lot of the areas. Um, I, I do agree we need some sort of nimbleness because things need tested and things are changing. So it, I think the motion that is sent to us and what it includes has to be thought out very carefully. Um, based on all of that for what we as a council would be granting and who we might be granting additional modification authority to, especially since this pandemic is changing rapidly, we don't know what November is going to look like and whether things that we institute now for May are going to need to be instituted in November. So I, we, we have to have some of that. Um, what I, I was concerned about the operating times um, as it relates to lines and setup and cleanup, this is a lot of additional uh, setup from what it appears to be to me on the market staff's point of view, not necessarily on the vendor point of view, although with parking limited on the vendor point of view. So is there enough time? What are the operating times? What are the reservation times? Is there enough time to get it set up before the market opens? What happens if there's a line at whatever the intended close time is? 
does that line get finished? What is an absolute max time that everyone has to be cleared out by if the line is going to be finished at whatever time the market normally closes? If there's two hours more of people waiting in line because of limited numbers of people being able to go through, what's going to happen with all of that? Um, fencing, hand wash stations, porta potties, there was no indication totally whether those will be inserted and removed every Saturday. Um, fencing seems like it could be, but porta potties and hand wash stations seem a little more costly. I, I, and I don't know all of this, but clarification to ensure that they will either be removed every time or what happens to them if they're not. Um, the disposable gloves, the guidelines from the state indicated that all uh, market vendors should be wearing disposable gloves, but nowhere in the memo was indicated anything about the use of disposable gloves by people handling product. So I'd like that clarified. Um, face masks, we've talked about already. Um, the, the costs, um, as many people know, last year I voted against the use of this public way for the farmer's market solely because not because I don't support the farmer's market, but because the farmer's market pays nothing for Saturday morning use of highly trafficked and highly sought after parking. Um, Andy brought up the fact that it has not always favored Amherst farmer's market. Sarah brought that up. I'm concerned with who is going to shoulder the costs of increased presence of town staff whether there will need to be a required police presence to monitor lines. If so, who's going to show those costs? Would those costs be reimbursable if the town does that under FEMA? Um, so more clarification on that would be great. And the last one, sorry, this is a long list, curbside pickup. There wasn't a lot of information about what that actually looks like logistically and who, how much of the curb is being blocked by like where the pre-ordered food is being stored and all of that um, because there's no good entrance exit from the market on that end given all the fencing what's the storage look like and is that taking up sidewalk space that we've been told would remain um, free and open so a bigger plan on what curbside pickup looks like and how it's going to affect the public way thank you i'm sorry that was so long that's fine dorothy Dorothy, please mute. Unmute. Okay, there we go. Okay, there the we technology go. changed in me. Okay, I have a couple of things to add to this, and I just want you to understand that uh, I don't have a conflict of interest because my daughter does not uh, use the Amherst Farmers Market. Um, I think Mandy Joe had a lot of great questions as to who should pay for it, but um, as of this moment, I think the town should pay for it just because it would be something wonderful and live going on in the center of downtown when we've had just really death down there, just no, no reason to go down most of the time. So um, I did check on the Greenfield Farmers Market spot and, and maybe Paul can comment on this, but it, it mentioned something about armies of volunteers. That's one way to reduce some of the cost and not have all of the recruitment on the shoulders of the vendors is that to have some way in which people can volunteer and maybe get some training with social distancing um, to help with the traffic flow. Um, my major thought was um, when I looked at the chart, at the, at the, the graph, whatever, uh, of the three lines of, of vendors, and you may have said this somewhere in your proposal, what if the vendors, at least on the outside, faced outside so that the public is not walking in those narrow pathways, which I just, I look at them and I think, oh, they're going to be too close to each other. But the public is walking um, uh, like in the park or on the parking lot on the other sides. And I, I'm not sure what that would do to the middle, but it would mean that the trucks would be facing inside um, and that the vendors would be interacting with each other. And, um, you know, I just think that's a possibility of making it a better social distancing. But um, I'm very much in favor of getting this thing going. Um, I gather that one of my old favorites, um, Bread Euphoria, might not be there because it's um, 
sec it's what do we call it value added it's bakery um is there any clarification there'd be no fresh bread no baked goods um from anybody but anyway i think it would be great and as, as people have pointed out it's not just that that a lot of people love to get the fresh vegetables or we want to support Amherst farmers, but this is a way for people with limited finances to get an extra amount of money on their SNAP cards. So it's, it's very basic. Darcy. Yeah, I just have uh, one additional question that it would be really nice to be, get an answer for tonight. And that is, uh, because the TSO committee is trying to figure out whether or not we need to add a special meeting on the 11th, whether um, uh, it's clear that with all these different accommodations that need to be provided, whether, we're, whether the farmer's market is actually very sure that they would be able to be ready by the 23rd um, if we did um, decide on, on the town council meeting on the 18th. So do, do we need to scramble or do we not? Okay, okay. thank you, Darcy. Um, before we move on to uh, any response, uh, this is, let me just say, I'm a, I'm a serious farmer's market supporter. I show up whenever I'm in town. Um, I periodically run into Paul, who's there checking it out. Um, so I wanted to just um, mention a few things that rose up for me and also just tell you that I've had two constituents, three constituents actually, and another person uh, come to me and say, well, why don't they just take it outside of downtown? Well, I, I don't want that. I wanna see it downtown. I wanna see it part of our reopening. Um, I do wonder whether or not we should start out with a smaller number of vendors and grow it so that we can get the kinks out of the effort. And I know we normally start out with a smaller number of vendors in the spring anyway, but I wonder if we wanna provide some guidance on that. Um, I also wonder, since we aren't gonna be able to use the town common for much of anything else this summer, why we don't just use the town common? Uh, it's a huge area. It's what this was meant for. And I just want us to open up our thinking about that uh, and how we might open it in different ways mm -hmm. that um, would allow us to reconfigure our thinking right. about this. Um, the obviously the issue of no, no masks and so forth. And then I'm gonna just tell you as a senior, cause I am one, um, I wouldn't even bother with senior hours. Senior hours only jam everybody of a certain age into a certain time. And the farmer's mm -hmm. market is, though it's multi-age, do you have some very strong, long time senior supporters? And I just let them come whenever and not bother with your senior hours. Um, if people feel they need to because of the governor's guidance, I totally accept that. But I don't, I don't personally wanna feel bound by that. And I won't feel yeah. bound by that. Um, I, I really wanna, say, I don't think we want to try to get into solving all of this tonight. We can't. There's no way. I would also personally be more than glad to continue to work with the farmer's market to get us to a plan for you to reopen. And I'm also willing to be one of your volunteers that will be trained to help people social distance. Um, so Paul, you might want to answer the first question and then maybe we have some closing remarks. Uh, although I do see one other hand, Sarah. I, I just want to say as someone who attempted to be a vendor for the Amherst Farmers Market, um, it still isn't easy for an Amherst farmer to um, be in the market. And I think that's something that TSO needs to talk about. Um, and I will say that uh, being in being having a place in that farmers market is a privileged uh, position for farmers, and I want to reiterate that um, this it's not completely nonprofit. The manager, the longtime manager of the market, does um, collect a fee from each vendor, and I really think that we need to the town of Amherst needs to talk about. Um, how we handle it. So 
Okay. Paul? So thank you. I think counselors raised a lot of really good points. I think we would have answers to them. I think you're right to not put your time into this, but I think the one that really needs to be answered by the farmer's market, and I don't know the answer to that, is the timing for when they want to, when they expect it to be open and how much urgency the council should put on it because uh, right now it would require, if they were really looking at May 23rd, it would require the council to have a special committee meeting and whether that's something that's in the, in the after you've heard all the councilors' concerns, if you think for David or John, if you think that that's realistic or if you think that June 1st, which gives the council a little bit more time is more appropriate, whatever, or not June 1st, June, May 30th, I guess, or. June May I respond? Next Saturday is it would be yeah. the 30th. May I respond? Since yes, the question please. is being asked of the farmer's market, and I've been there a while. Um, I just want to say that there are a couple of things I wanted to respond to. Um, yes, we can be ready. I've already made arrangements to pick up a lot of the PPE equipment uh, to CISA. In fact, they just sent me an email half an hour or so ago. Uh, I also want to point out that our market rules are written so that the town of Amherst, any farmer in town, is first accepted into the market. That rule was written in, as uh, Mr. Steinberg said, whenever the Agricultural Commission said that, and it's always been open, and anyone in Amherst, whether they be a farmer or a producer, are accepted into that market. So no one's been ever turned away. And as president of the market, I assure you that I have stood behind that rule and in fact, have accepted people into the market of Amherst before this was was an issue. Uh, so um, I, I I can't say anything else except that we we have written explicitly in our rules that first preference is given to anyone in Amherst, either as a farmer or as a producer. So we are trying to benefit the the, the farmers of Amherst mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as bring safe food to, to Amherst and and to accommodate. What, whatever it, we've been asked to do in, in a very safe fashion. So I, I think that, that I want to assure council members and town manager that we can be ready and that we have the ability to do what we say we're going to do. May I chime in just real quickly? Yes, please. Um, uh, just, yeah, I did want to answer Andy's point before I, I forgot the question actually, but mm -hmm. I think Sarah bringing it up and John just echoing it. Um, since I've come back to the farmer's market running it for the last three years, there's not been an Amherst producer or vendor, potential vendor that's been turned away that qualifies I allow the, uh, the market requirements. So anybody that is an Amherst grower or producer is given priority and we've shoehorned people in to make sure that that accommodation has been made. So there's not anybody that I've seen, anybody that's applied formally through me that's been turned away. Um, regards to the startup day, we were, we were really hoping for, Mother's Day, um, obviously that's not a possibility. So we had pushed it out, hoping to get the market open for Memorial Day, as that's a big day for many of the vendors. Um, in regards to immediacy, this whole thing is a situation in flux, and if we can get out there for Memorial Day, great. If we can't, we'll just make do and you know fulfill the accommodations that are required. Well, you know, the sooner we can get out there, the better. But depending on how it's to be done, to be done safely. We need to go with the protocols involved and those are ever changing and we want to make sure that everybody is safe and that everybody has the opportunity to get out there and get fresh food, fresh produce. Um, the fact that we do take up a very public way on Saturdays, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a valid question, but also we're all only doing it during the early part of the day, 7.30 to 1.30. Um, years ago, we had a study done by UMass, Don Marion, Extension Services, which did a head count and the numbers that go through on the market day is a draw of between 34 and 4,200 people. So I think that while we are an opportunity cost regards to parking maybe for Saturday mornings, we do draw in a lot of footsteps into the center of town. And that is nothing but a, a benefit, I think, for the economic gains of all of the merchants, not just the market, but all of the merchants inclusive. And one final point, I, I, I have no, uh, no reservations at all if we were to be told for this year to deal with the COVID issue to go out onto the green onto the common it's a huge space it's a lovely space social distancing would be um i would say really barely even a challenge out there because we would have so much room to spread out and give every vendor the possibility of a nice radius orbit of safety around them 
So I think that um, aside from stewarding the customers through, that sort of opportunity of expanding the market parameters would um, enable a safe opening, if you will, for an unprecedented time in the market year this year. Unless there's any other counselor comments, what we're going to do is now uh, vote to refer this to TSO. That's not an automatic referral. Um, I've seen no other comments. And um, so let me just start by the motion is to refer the Amherst Farmers Market long-term reservations of the public ways request dated zero, uh, 030920 and the town manager's memo dated 043020 to the town services and outreach committee for a report and recommendation to the council by May, Monday, May 18, 2020. Is there a second? Second. second. I have several. I'll leave it, I think <laughs> I'll leave it to you to sort out who. Alyssa, you have your hand up. I just wanted to speak to the motion quickly in terms of being clear for everyone who, I know some people had more questions than others, but if TSO doesn't meet about this at all until the 18th, today's the 4th. Mm -hmm. So if we don't do anything until the 18th, that gives no guidance to the farmer's market, that gives no guidance to town staff, and it also means that we're meeting Monday morning the 18th and we're expecting you to approve it that night. So if you think there's any chance that you don't, you won't get what you want out of this conversation, then I'm not sure it's a great idea to say that you don't want to hear back from us until we have a meeting Monday morning the 18th and we have a meeting Monday night. We're clearly not going to be able to write a long report. We're just going to have to give a bunch of it verbally. Even if Darcy's amazing as chair, that's not going to be feasible. So I just want to be clear what people's expectations are. If people are okay with us waiting until the 18th and literally you know, not really doing anything until the 18th and then quickly all doing it the 18th. And if people are unhappy with the results of what we provide on the 18th, being willing to go beyond the 23rd for the first date. Okay. I just want to make sure nobody's confused by that. That's correct. If we are not, if we do not feel that all the concerns have been answered, then we can delay the vote. Uh, Dorothy, please unmute. I want to second what Alyssa said. I think that TSO should meet on the 11th and um, be able to pass on what they uh, conclude uh, for the, to the town council meeting that evening. And that way, if there are any residual problems, they can dealt, be dealt with properly. I, I personally think it's really important for the farmer's market to open a Memorial Day weekend. I mean, what are we going to do for Memorial Day? We've got absolutely nothing planned. Weekends are the emptiest time of my calendar. I think it'd be very exciting to have the farmer's market open and maybe some other businesses uh, do some kind of table in the street further up the block. I mean, I think we should open up the town a little bit, at least on that day. Uh, I still see two hands up. Uh, Alyssa, yes, or was that just you didn't take it down? Okay, and Dorothy's the same. Any other questions? The motion's been made and seconded, and it's a roll call vote. And we will now uh, start with Pat DeAngelis. This is the motion to refer. Yes. Uh, Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Greismer is a yes. Man Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Steve, I, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Sarah Schwartz, are you still connected? I'll come back on that. Athena, could you please check on Sarah? Uh, Shalini Balmilne? Yes. 
Alyssa Brewer? No. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and Sarah has not rejoined us. All right, so the vote is 11 in favor of referral, one against and none abstaining and one absent. Okay, we're moving on to the next item, which was also on the consent agenda and was pulled off. And it, this is regarding the 133, 143 Southeast Street. And before we move on, John and David, thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to working through all of this with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Take care. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Paul, do you want to introduce this? And maybe Chris Brestrup wants to be part of that. Yes, so the, uh, and I, I will defer to Chris very quickly. Um, so this is an application from uh, a person, a, 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 an entity that's seeking to build an apartment building on Southeast Street. It went through the Planning Board Conservation Commission and part of their uh, review required um, some activity on the town common, on the co the public way. I won't say the town common because it's not town common. So Chris, if you'd like to go into that. So, um, yes, hello, I'm Chris Brestrup, um, Planning Director. Um, as part of the work on uh, 133, 143 Southeast Street, um, the person who wants to build the building is Amir McShee, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, and he, um, in order to get out of the uh, wet conditions on the site, needed to raise the building pad about three or four feet. And in order to do that, he needed to, um, well, he wanted to, have the building be as close as possible to the front property line, and therefore he needed I to grade, grade I'm, into I'm, the public way. The public way is very wide at that point. Um, and maybe Athena could bring up the image of the um, of the building that's being proposed to be built, and then it shows the the public way. So the building is. Um, 60, no, 57 apartment units and three, I believe, um, yeah, there it is, 57 apartment units and three retail spaces uh, on the ground floor. It's a three-story building, and it's part of the business um, village center zoning district. And um, you can see, oh, look at that. I can, um, I think I can uh, <laughs> show you where the public way is. It's everything from the building face out to the curb line and within, or excuse me, the curb line is here, yeah. Um, within that area, Mr. McChee would like to create um, a bus stop and a series of walkways, which are going around like this, and then um, a sitting space. Um, and his retail spaces in his building are at this um, southeastern corner. So the sitting space would accommodate people in his building, as well as people who might, um, you know, get a sandwich at Cumberland Farms and come over here and sit um, <clears throat> sit in this nice space. I think the space and the uh, plans for what's being proposed in the public way are would be an asset to the town. Um, it would take an area that's fairly barren right now and create a place where people might wish to congregate once COVID-19 is um, no longer part of our lives. Um, and um, he's, Mr. McChee is proposing to add some street trees and a bike rack. And I think this is a bench here. Um, he's got some benches in his uh, space, in his semicircular space here. Um, so this was um, something that he offered to do in order to be able to work within the town right of way. And as I said before, the work within the town right of way, the minimum amount of work that he needs to do is to grade a slope from the front of his building out into the town right of way here. Um, and it's probably about a three or four feet uh, going down from the building pad down to whatever the existing condition would be. So that would be the minimal amount of work. but. Um, 
the planning board thought this was a good idea, what he's proposing here. Um, I think the design review board uh, agreed with that and they did submit some comments, which I think you have, um, and you have copies of the planning board's decisions. Um, so um, I think that's, that's probably all I'll say for now, but if you have questions, I'm perfectly happy to answer your questions. Okay. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you, Chris. Um, I look through the various documents and I just want to point out the particular picture you, you brought up um, still says 62 units. So you just need to fix it because the other ones all say 57 units. So my question on the public way is um, on the various other diagrams also show what's being proposed there. Um, it's the cost of maintenance of that, both installing it and that over time there's a um, a decorative brick patio area, there's some benches, there's a, a, a disposable a trash can, and this would be on the public way, but put in by a private developer. And I'm assuming that doesn't mean they own the land, but they'd be permanently using it. So will we have a concrete agreement with them to keep of upkeep on that, on trimming the trees, keeping the patio in good shape, or or could it deteriorate over time? And I saw that there was a special permit granted because of the use of the public way that the setback that would normally have been more from the front um, was reduced. So it's nearer to the little walkway than it might be because the public way is so deep. And so we've given him some additional space to build on and giving him, giving him, giving the developer use of this. So I just want to make sure we're protected. Um, then the other question is less related directly to the public way, but they're going to be uh, some number of apartments in this. I think it's 12 that will not be allowed to have a parking space. And I'm not sure what provisions have been put in that stop them, people from getting a car and packing, parking at the bank or parking along this new public way, clogging the street. Is that um, violation enough to lose their lease? But I'm a little worried that what looks like big wide open space could be clogged because there aren't enough parking spaces. So it's both the maintenance costs, seating, you know, the frontage, we, we let that get narrower than it would have been required. We get a special permit. So it's, those are my questions. Chris? Um, so in terms of the maintenance, um, Mr. McChee has stated that he will maintain this area. I think he's gonna maintain everything except for the um, lights, the street lights that are gonna be put in. Um, and those would be maintained by the town. But otherwise, you know, he'll mow the grass and he'll um, maintain the little sitting area and maintain the walkways um, and the bicycle racks and the benches and everything. So that's, um, I imagine he will have to make some sort of a written agreement with the town, but that wasn't really part of the planning board's um, review process because the planning board doesn't have jurisdiction over the right of way. Maybe Mr. Bockelman could speak to that issue. Um, in terms of the setback, yes, the planning board did grant Mr. McChee a, a um, modification of the setback requirement. I believe that the setback requirement was 10 feet, and I think that the setback that he's actually um, gotten in this um, in the final plan was um, three feet, and that did require a special permit from the planning board, and they did grant that. Um, I think even if he had had a 10 foot setback, it would have been hard for him to do the grading within the um, narrow area that he had available to him. Um, so I, I don't really have too much more to say about that. Um, <clears throat> 12, par uh, 12 apartments would have no parking spaces. That would be in the lease um, for those apartments. And um, Mr. McChief feels that there are people in town who um, ride the bus or ride their bicycles or, you know, have some alternative tr forms of transportation so that they don't need parking and that they will be happy to live in this apartment building without um, parking spaces. So that's something that um, 
the uh, committee of town council may wish to delve into further. I'm sure that Mr. McChee and his consultants will be meeting with the committee when, when this is presented to them. Um, and then in terms of parking along the new public way, well, there really aren't any parking spaces provided. There are two bus stops provided, one on the east side and one on the west side, but there aren't um, really parking spaces provided along along the way. Um, <clears throat> we did get some uh, comments of concern from Florence Savings Bank about whether um, the tenants from this building would park in the Florence Savings Bank parking lot. And Mr. McChee um, stated that he would monitor uh, his part, his tenants and, um, you know, wouldn't allow them to park over there. So that's kind of a an arrangement or a conversation that would happen between um, Florence Savings Bank and Mr. McChee. Um, Florence Savings Bank does have the ability to tow uh, cars that are parked on their park um, in their parking lot um, without permission. So uh, that may be an arrangement that just has to be worked out between the between the property owners. Before we go on with questions, I need clarification from the town manager. This is a request regarding public way. So it doesn't seem to me that the issue of whether there are sufficient parking spaces should be coming before the council at this time. Well, yes, this is a request to for the builder to build to build this project with use of the public way by doing the things in. Uh, and I think what Chris is saying is that if you don't grant this approval, that he probably cannot move forward on this project. But the issue of getting into sufficient parking spaces is normally not. Yeah, I think. That... Yeah, so so again, this actually the question before the council is whether you want to refer it to the TSO committee or not. So yes, that would be you would be your your topic of conversation should be about the public way and the use of that public way permanently. And not about whether there's parking or not. Parking space. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank. That's the clarification yep. I need. Dorothy. Okay. Um, I have been to many, many meetings when this was discussed, and yet today is the first time that I realize that the partly public way area, the green part in front of the building, is on a deep slope. So what I see here in the flat picture looks as if it's grassy space with trees that has some social purpose or can, can at least have people standing or walking there. But if it's a slope, then it's really not what I had thought it was. Um, I find the idea of giving a variance from 10 feet on the sidewalk to three and having the sidewalk right up against the building, um, no space on any side, I think that's um, not a good design. Um, Mr. Mitchie would be allowed to continue this project, but not as it is pre presently designed. He originally started out as everybody does in town with fewer units. Then they come back and double units. So this land that he has does not support a project of this size as far as I'm concerned. And I do not think that the town of Amherst should give its public way to, so it ends up we have a sloping piece of of land and we have a narrow sidewalk right up in front of a building where there may be some shops and I think some of them may be residential units. So I, I, I think it's a very bad plan. Evan. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, to try to say this as uh, politely as possible, but it, it does sound like some of my colleagues on the council seem to think that they've been appointed to the planning board and not to the town council. Uh, issues of parking, issues of setbacks, uh, these are questions that uh, lie in the domain of the planning board and were discussed by the planning board. I know that Dorothy was at many of the meetings. I don't know if Kathy looked at them, but the issue of parking and where people would park and parking spaces was discussed at length um, in the planning board. And so I'm getting very nervous listening to this conversation because this is potentially coming to TSO to decide whether we want to allow um, way. these modifications of the public way. It's not for us to render judgment on the project or the building itself. And, and, and so 
I don't think that it's our, our uh, responsibility to decide um, whether or not this project should go forward. Or it's to decide the public way request. And so that makes me wonder what people expect TSO to do. And so I've often been an advocate um, of more specific referrals on this council. I sometimes get uncomfortable with just referring issues to committees without telling those committees what we're looking for from them. Um, and this would be something that I would want a more specific referral. What do you want TSO to tell you to come back from this? Because at this point, I don't actually see a reason to refer this to TSO. We have information before us. We have recommendations from the planning board. We have recommendations from the design review board. CONCOM has weighed in on this. And we're just asked, do you want to allow use of public way for a bus stop, some sidewalks, a plaza, things that actually align very well with uh, what we were talking about earlier about complete streets. And, and so to me, I could vote on this right now tonight and allow this project to move forward and unless i can hear someone talk about what they what they expect tso to add what the value add is of tso which i hope would be wrapped into the referral i don't know why we are why, why there's a need to refer this to tso as opposed to just saying every other committee has looked at this do we think that this is a good use of the public way in this part but I don't want to hear any discussions about parking requirements or setbacks or things that have already been discussed ad nauseum by the planning board. Mandy Jo. Uh, I second everything Evan said. Uh, the planning board dealt with all of that. That is not our job. We are asked to look at the improvements to the public way that would become permanent, which is sidewalks, a plaza, some benches, a um, bus stop, bike racks, benches, and then potentially a shelter at the bus stop and say, are we going to allow those permanent public way changes that under the proposal aren't even going to cost the town anything other than the maintenance of the street lighting? Because the developer, Mr. Um, I'm not even sure how to say his last name, Machi, um, has agreed to pay for all of the improvements in the public way and the maintenance of everything but the street lights. Uh, we are to render a decision as to whether we agree with those changes to the public way and only the public way. Uh, I, I look at this and I say, this is a vast improvement over the current public way. It actually shows that it's a public way and not someone's front yard, which the current and past use looked like, I didn't even know the way was this wide. Um, and now we're going to get an actual public use, public way, sidewalks, benches, bike racks. I, I'm having a hard time seeing a downside to this, number one. Um, in terms of what TSO could do to answer Evan's question, the design review board, while having a unanimous vote, um, had some recommendations that are not quite a part of this plan. And so given that we would be sort of accepting a plan, I think TSO could come back as to whether to um, add into that plan the design review board's recommendations or not, um, because they specifically said they couldn't mandate it, it's the town council's job. So I think that's something the TSO could do um, to, to ensure whether we should be accepting the DRB's recommendations or going another way with those recommendations and saying the current plan minus those recommendations is, is fine. So that's where I see TSO being able to give something to the council that is concrete. So Mandy, Joe, and Evan, I just wanna say the reason I asked Paul for that earlier clarification was for exactly the reason you point out. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Now, I just wanna clarify what I said. My beginning comment was about the public way and the cost of maintaining it. And Chris answered that it could be a requirement that this be in writing rather than verbal. So that is one thing that TSO could be recommended to the town about the public way. I only raised the parking on the concern that there were cars along the street or places where the bus, and Chris did answer that. There's not gonna be any parking along the street. So it's not gonna spill out over to the street. I wasn't questioning the planning board. So I was going back to the public way. He may 
the developer may agree to install all of this for free, but 10 years from now, I would like to know that the developer has agreed in writing to maintain it as well. Okay. Dorothy? I think that um, uh, Evan raised some good points. Um, uh, what is TSL supposed to do? Um, the public way is the public way. If we are the keepers of the public way, then I think we have to think about what, when we give it away, how easily do we give it away? Do we just give it away anytime somebody says, I really would like to do put something on that? Um, maybe it looks better than what's there, but it might not look as good as something else that could be there. Um, I, I enjoyed Mandy Joe's suggestion that we look at the design review board suggestions, but the question remains really, what is it we're supposed to do with the public way? Are we the guardians of the people? I mean, do we protect it for the people or what are, what are we supposed to do? Because the phrase public way sounds like a public trust to me. So this, this is a larger piece of land because I, when we originally saw it, it was actually called a, a green, a town, a town common. And then they started getting confused as to what to call it, but it was a larger piece of land that belonged to the town. So that's, those are my questions. Steve Schreiber. Hi. So long time, as a long time planning board member, I think that everything's fair game. So in other words, they're asking for use of the public way. Therefore, their project is subject to scrutiny that I think is our job. So I, I actually don't have, you know, as much of an issue of the counselors sort of weighing in on what they think could possibly be improved because they are asking for something from us. And I, so I think that that's for game, whether or not that has standing, that's to be seen. So I think my main issue is that I wish I knew what the master plan was for this town public way. So it, it, your Dorothy's absolutely right. Councilor Pam is absolutely right that at one time this was presented as an extension of the, or part of the East Common. And then we were told that it's not part of the East Common. Whatever it is, it's a much wider right of way that's elsewhere, like just below this the right of way gets much narrower. And just above this, the Florence Savings Bank, I think really botched their part of the public right of way. So it would be nice to, that would be, that's my only, that's not gonna be solved in the time, this building's under construction, that's gonna be not gonna be solved. But I wish I knew what the big idea, what the plan was for the entire right of way. And that's really the only way that I have to evaluate whether or not this is consistent with that. Andy Steinberg. So I, uh, I analogize it to what we did on Spring Street already, because Spring Street, we were looking at changes that were being proposed to how the parking would be used in front of the building and how the spaces would be used in front of the building. We were not um, looking at the building itself. That had been a decision made by the planning board, which is appropriately within their um, pur purview. I think that the motion could be strengthened um, by words to the effect of being referred to solely for um, a feed information regarding the proposal to use the public way but I do think we need to make sure that it is distinguished from the building issues that have already been addressed through the appropriate panel and the hearing process was quite extensive. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up still. So I just wanted to address one of Ms. Pam's um, concerns, which had to do with um, the fact that she thought there might be a big slope within the public way. So they're going to be um, grading the the area down from, you know, what I said, three or four feet um, out into this area, but it's going to be a gradual slope. So we're not expecting that there's going to be a sudden drop off or anything like that. They've done a pretty good grading plan, and I hope that when the applicant and his um, consultant come to the TSO, or I think it's the TSO, to um, talk about this, that they will present their grading plan and, and talk about what their slope, um, what the level of slope is. But it, I don't feel like um, it's going to be an abrupt slope at all. I think they've done a pretty good job with grading it. 
Dr. DeAngelis? This is kind of my neighborhood. Um, I go to the pharmacy and the bank on a regular basis. Looking at this picture and looking at the public way, I'm, I'm quite drawn to it. I think it's going to um, make a positive change. I do not think this should be referred to TSO. Um, I think, and, and I'm concerned about how TSO long term will work anyway. I, I'm very concerned that it is difficult for me and for other counselors to separate themselves from their opinions and desires to see what the real issues are. Um, so I would like to not refer this to TSO and accept the design. Um, the planning board's proposal and accept the de uh, developer's proposal of, uh, in terms of using the public way. All right, we're at the point now, the motion we have drafted is a referral motion. If someone would like to make a different motion, please do so at this time. Dorothy. Okay. Um, I would like to follow up with Mandy Joe's suggestion and say that uh, it be referred to TSO uh, for the express purpose of looking at the suggestions from the design review board and deciding whether they were relevant. All right, so we'll try to work that into the motion. Is there any other comment on that? Chris? So um, I think that it's really a more, um, it's a broader discussion than just the um, concerns that were raised by the Design Review Board. The Design Review Board has some specific things that it's looking at, and it's mostly looking at the aesthetics of, of an issue. Um, but what the Town Council is um, charged with is figuring out what the use of the land is. So I think, you know, Ms. Pam is going in the right direction, but I think that the um, referral should encompass the use of the land. It should encompass whether you want these sidewalks here, whether you want the bus stop here, um, whether you want a public space right in front of this building, um, the grading and all of those things, including the issues that the design review board looks, looks at. So that would be my recommendation that you really, you know, take a complete look at what's being proposed here and not just focus on the aesthetics issue, issues. Um, let me just say that the what the what will be referred is the proposal, mm -hmm. and and with that proposal comes all of that option for people to look at. Alyssa, as a member of TSO who's not eager to receive this referral, I don't really understand. I was trying to reread the DRB memo again, and I don't really understand what it is that they voted but said they couldn't mandate. And so, and then Chris is saying, well, but that's just design aesthetics and you need to hear from the developer and you need to hear from his consultants. And I have no idea why I would need to hear from any of them about any of this. So I was thinking along the same lines Pat was, and I, it may be Mandy G Joe could point out to me because I'm just not reading it correctly, what it is that we would want to do potentially that DRB was not allowed to make a decision on. And I think the other thing we're losing sight of here is timeliness. If this is an issue before a person can start, I have no reason to believe TSO even has time to do this anytime in the month of May. So, uh, you know, it's all well and good to say, well, the developer can come talk to you, but we're again what is our value add if somebody can be really specific mm -hmm. in in the referral that would be helpful to me george tso is um trying to determine its own processes with the various things that are sent to it and here's a classic example um, a use of the public way which is supposed to come to us and, and i assume this will come to us and we're gonna have to figure out how to deal with it and it seems to me that's just part of the joy of being a member of that committee. Um, a number of issues have been raised tonight that uh, TSO can certainly sink its teeth into. I don't know about the timing issue, but that's something that uh, the chair and the committee will have to resolve in terms of priorities. But I don't see how this can avoid not coming to us 
and how we can avoid not uh, dealing with it. Um, Kathy raised a good point about ensuring that there be some kind of written agreement, if that's appropriate, um, to make sure that this is maintained. Um, the, uh, Chris raised, raised a good point about the simple fact that we're dealing with the use of this space and whatever that entails. And I think that's something we need to talk about and think about. So I'm in favor of simply having it referred without all kinds of writers and attachments. Uh, we've had a thorough discussion. Many good points have been raised. And now it's time for TSO, whether we like it or not, to actually uh, do what uh, our charge says we're supposed to do. Um, I'm going to take another comment or two, and then we're going to uh, move to the motion. Evan? Yeah, I actually had a, a timing question. I guess this would be for Chris. You know, um, one of the reasons, Andy brought up the Spring Street proposal earlier, and one of the reasons that we felt comfortable sort of sending that to a committee and having it kicked down the road is we were told, and they don't really need an answer on this until they're finishing up. It sounds to me like they need an answer on this before they start. So I'd just like to get an idea of what their timeline is. And also, I don't know if they're, I don't know how COVID has impacted their construction, um, if they're trying to move forward. So just some clarification there. Chris, please clarify. So, um, yes, uh, Mr. McChee wanted to get started on this project last fall. And um, as soon as he received his um, okay from the uh, planning board, he um, you know, started doing some work on the site and the building commissioner shut him down because he didn't have a building permit and he hadn't gotten permission from town council. So he's been waiting for quite a while since you know, sometime in late October or, or November to get started here. So he certainly has um, you know, or had a timeline that indicated that you know he really needed to know soon. I don't know what his situation is now based on um, you know the COVID situation, but I assume that he's still uh, planning to move ahead quickly with this. Otherwise, he wouldn't have submitted something to town council. Chris, um, Chris, my question is: Does he need to have the design? or does he need to have the permission regarding the public way approved in order to start? Yes, he does, because he's filling his site by whatever I said, three or four feet, and therefore he's going to have to fill within the town right of way in order to build his building. Uh, thank you. Mandy Joe. Mandy Joe, you need to. Yeah, no, I was working on unmuting. Um, that is, I'm trying to look at the record of decision and I'm not seeing it on here. Um, that's different than I had gathered from reading the hundred and some pages of, of documents we got. Um, that, you know, with the Spring Street, it was, they just had to apply to us for the use before they could issue the building permit. Um, and this one, I guess, is slightly different than that. Um, but but I wanted to say the I think we need to refer this. The design review review board had a motion that was voted unanimously to recommend the following add a recycling receptacle, provide a bench with arms at the bus location, and provide two benches without arms at the plaza location and optional if the applicant decides to replace the existing acorn like lighting fixture across the street to match the applicant's proposed light fixtures, the board would be grateful, but this is not an official recommendation. So these are only recommendations that aren't currently a part of the plan. And so if we were going to accept this plan and we wanted to accept those recommendations, we'd have to change the acceptance of the plan to add those recommendations in. As Kathy said, we'd have to do stuff. So that's stuff that I would like to see TSO do. So I, I, I support the referral. Um, I'd like, further clarification because I'm not seeing anything in the site plan, the planning board record of decision that requires them in, in my first quick read. What I remember reading was that the construction on the public way won't even begin till August of 2021, I think is what it was. Um, and so that made me think that we could refer and we would have a little bit of time that wouldn't delay the construction. So more clarification on that would be helpful. Um, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, so um, uh, on the site plan review, item 13 says site improvements proposed within the town right of way shall be reviewed and approved by the town council 
after review and recommendations from the design review board prior to construction. So that's the trigger that brings it to the town council. Okay. I think we need to go ahead with the motion to refer. Uh, I'm going to put the motion out there and ask for a second um, to refer the 133 and 143 Southeast Street permanent uh, use of public way request dated 030520 and the town manager memo dated 043020 to the town services and outreach committee for a report and recommendation to the council in 90 days. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Evan. So I, I'm, I'm really struggling with this one because we're delaying the start of the construction of this project, which is money for the developer. It's, it's, it's potential uh, lost opportunity for us. So I, I'm intending to vote against the motion, but I'd be more amenable to voting for it if we could shrink that 90 day requirement, because I, the, even though TSO might not use the 90 days, it'd be great to at least send a message that says, we're not going to wait three months to get this back to us. Are you wanting to put that in the form of an amendment? I can. Um, so I would move to amend the motion uh, to reduce it to uh, 30 days. Motion's been made. Is there a second? This is Andy. I second. Amendment to the original motion's been made. Is there a second? Andy. This is Andy and I second. Okay. So the uh, motion is to change the time that you would recommend that they report back to the council to 30 days. We will vote first on the motion to amend the amendment and then to the original motion. Alyssa, do you have your hand up? Yes. Yes, I was just going to say I support ex for exactly what Evan said, 30 days. I'm rather appalled that they've had this problem since October and we're not hearing about it until the middle of May. So I feel like we really need to show that we're trying to do our due diligence and I think 30 days would be good. Mandy Jo? So I was gonna make a similar one. I support the 30 days. I do just wanna mention that um, this is not that the town delayed this. So I'm not sure despite yeah. what people are saying, how urgent the developer believes this approval to be because they got a design review review board opinion at some point um, and had a letter dated March 5th from them, from their consultants or Berkshire design group that the town hall didn't even receive till April 21st. So they apparently sat on a letter for six weeks. Um, and so if it was, extremely important to them they wouldn't have been sitting on that letter for six weeks um so you know i i question how important it might be to them given those dates um but i do support the 30 days referral instead of 90. uh darcy you also have your hand up darcy I would just say that I think that it would be extremely difficult to get it done in 30 days, which is just two meetings. Um, uh, and we have a pretty jammed agenda already. So um, I would find that extremely difficult to do. Dorothy? Okay. I just, uh, I think the dates of the letter and the holding of the letter don't indicate um, necessarily indicate that uh, he's not um, in a hurry. Those are the dates where people were going crazy, figuring out what the heck, are we gonna have an, a, an epidemic, a pandemic? Um, you know, March 5th, that's when it really began to hit home and he may have had to stop and think, my, what am I gonna do? So I, I wouldn't hold that against him. I, I do think that um, a timely response, whether it's 30 days or whether it's um, between 30 and 60 days, but not 90 days, um, I, I do agree with Evan that we should um, move in a, as as fast as we can reasonably. Okay, a motion's been made to amend the original motion. The motion to amend is to change the time for reporting back 
with a recommendation to the council in 30 days. It's been made and seconded. We're going to move to the uh, vote. This is the vote on the amendment to change it to 30 days. And we'll start with, um, I guess, Darcy Dumont. No. Reesmer is a yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. <laughs> oh, yes. Ross. Yes. Brian. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz has um, needed to leave the meeting. Uh, Shalini Bowman. Yes. Brewer. Yes. And DeAngelis. Yes. The vote is 11 yes, one no, and no abstentions and one absent. We're now going to move on to the main motion. The main motion now reads to refer the 133 and 143 Southeast Street permanent use of public way request dated 030520 and town manager's memo dated 043020 to the town services and outreach committee for a report and recommendation to the council in 30 days. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further comment? Darcy, do you have your hand up from before or still? No, I no longer have it up. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to take a roll call vote on that. Um, so this time we start with Reese Marin, it's a yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ro uh, Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Sh uh, Shane? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Um, Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz is absent. Balmelm? Yes. Brewer? Yes. DeAngelis? Yes. Dumont? Yes. It's, uh, the vote is 12, zero, zero, and one absent. Um, we have taken care of the other votes for the evening in our consent. And so we move on at this point to the uh, community activity forms. And I believe, Evan, this comes out of OCA, so we're going to come to you. Yeah, um, so it's a little later than I <laughs> expected we'd get to this point, so I, I feel a little bad uh, throwing mm -hmm. an issue that's somewhat complicated at the council. Um, Would you after. like to refer it to, yeah. to the 18th? Zoom. Well, so what I was gonna say is, um, it comes with a recommendation to the council. My expectation was not that we would vote on the recommendation tonight um, be, and that we, because I didn't um, submit anything to waive rule 8.4. Um, and so it, it needs to be read again on the 18th um, or it needs to be read again. So um, I, it, if people really want to talk about this now, I'm fine going through it, but if people feel like they have the report um, I'm also fine just fielding questions or, or putting, um, this off. Okay. Mandy Joe. I just want to respectful of people's time. Right. Mandy Joe. I will be very quick. Um, I just want, I, I wonder if Oka actually does want to consider a second motion. Um, I know you guys were just recommending that we adopt the CAF as a council, the changes to the CAF. As I was reading section two of your new process, which is this community activity form section, um, it occurred to me that nearly all of that section is 
potentially something that the council could and maybe should adopt. Um, it deals with how long the calves are good for. Um, that it'll be a three year look back instead of a two year look back. Um, and now that the committee appointments, planning board, ZBA and finance committee are split between two separate council committees. I wonder if we want that to be standardized across the whole council, how long people look back and who responds to them when they are submitted through the town website. So that might be something I ask that OCA consider between now and the 18th as to whether maybe the community activity form paragraph in its process is more appropriate for the council as a whole. Yeah, uh, if I could just respond very briefly. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a good point. Um, so if you looked at the sort of line edits of the community activity form, um, the actual form, in the thing that they have to check off, that's where it says um, they're kept on file. It currently says two years. We we're going to replace it to three. And so I actually agree with you that that's a council decision, but I sort of saw the adoption of the revised CAF and striking the two and replacing it with three on the CAF um, disclaimer itself was sort of a de facto vote in support. But I think we could also separate those out if you feel like that should be in a, de a separate uh, decision. Okay. Darcy? Um, I'm just wondering if we, Evan had had um, suggested that we refer, the, re refer this to the next meeting, and I'm just wondering if that's still a possibility, because I'd be for doing that and assuming that this would not be considered the first meeting, and that would be considered the first meeting. Um, I I um, uh, I think you all saw that I sent out an opinion about the vote that we took on this process, and um, so I'm just interested to know if we're actually going to discuss that tonight or whether we want to refer this because it's late. And I need, uh, Mandy Joe, I just need to consult with you uh, if a counselor makes a motion at this point to just take this off and refer it for later, what would that motion be? Um, I, I, I'm not sure what, I don't think there would be a motion. This is a first discussion. In order to vote in any substance on this matter, we'd have to vote to waive our rules. Right. Uh, we don't have to vote on something on a second reading. There's plenty of things we've voted on on a third or fourth, and then there's always the charter um, right to postpone if someone doesn't want to vote at a second reading without having, would you, if, if that's the case, if someone doesn't feel they're ready, they can charter right to postpone during the motion at a second reading if the motion does come. So I'm not sure there is. That's, a that's what I needed to know. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa, you have a comment. Yes, I do. I realize it's super late, but I would like this to count as our first reading. As Mandy Jo says, um, you know, second reading is not the required night. We have to make the decision. We just have to make sure we have two readings minimally. And I think it would be entirely appropriate to make sure, see if the council had any questions about the actual OCA report that was provided well ahead of time. I think that it's deserved that the council actually took the time to read it and should be able to ask questions like Mandy Jo did. I also want to state very succinctly that the email that was sent to us tonight at 533 was an open meeting law violation, and I will not want to discuss that item tonight. Uh, Alyssa, you stay, okay. Darcy, is your hand still up or have you just not taken it down? Yes, it's still up. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I uh, if if this is the first reading, then then um, I would like to talk about my reasons for um, dissenting from the votes that were taken at the OCA meeting. And uh, just one second. Um, uh, I did. Um, Evan did include my um, 
my reasons that were stated at the meeting for uh, dissenting in the report that he has submitted. But um, as is usually the case with me, I have thought of other reasons um, after the vote. I frequently do that. Um, and I'm sure some of you do also. But um, uh, so I just wanted to go into those reasons which are in the in the um, memo that I sent at the beginning of the meeting. And um, yes, I send it a few Darcy, minutes. Darcy, I need to interrupt you. The memo that you sent at the beginning of the meeting is not part of the record, nor could it be part of the record because of the deliberation nature. I think we need to refer this back to TSO, I mean to OCA, for a way in which those all of that gets integrated into the report. Okay, well, I can still orally talk about my reasons for um, dissenting. Yes. Um, so basically, uh, the, um, the process that's being proposed, I object to because it doesn't provide uh, a check because of the fact that currently counselors automatically receive the CAFs. Um, they can get a sense of the pool of applicants themselves before the interviews. Um, and with the proposed process, if an applicant has applied within the last three years, which is frequently the case, um, he or she won't be required to submit a CAF. Um, and then the sitting counselors, this will be a step back for us because currently we get all the CAFs. Now there will be a whole block of people that won't ever submit CAFs. And so we won't see them. They may have uh, uh, applied three years ago, but we will not see those. We won't be able to look them up in our emails because we only took office a year ago. Um, and um, counselors won't ever have a means of seeing who's applied um, for who's who's actually applied for the current positions. They'll only see the pared down pool a week before the interviews. Okay. So, um, sure. I'm sorry, go ahead, Darcy. Um, so currently, as I said, the applications are automatically sent to all the counselors. And under the proposed process of requiring statements of interest, only the chair or the chair's designee will be receiving them. So that person will have the discretion to, to decide how and how many times the applicants need to be contacted speak to them off the record and decide when a person can be dropped from the pool. So there's nothing preventing that person from pursuing certain applicants further or seeking more applicants if, if depending on what the pool looks like. And I would argue that removing the possibility of bias is, isn't possible where there's only one counselor responsible for finalizing the pool of applicants and where, and the main thing that prevents a problem there is that if there's a check on that one person in the form of the whole council receiving CAFs automatically, like we do right now. So I am very much opposed to this process because, mainly because it doesn't provide a check on possible bias. Uh, I'm going to take a couple comments and then given the hour and the fact that we have not completed the agenda, we're going to move on since this is the first reading. Dorothy? Okay. Um, I uh, did read this, but I can't say that I read it well because I got very confused many times. So uh, the thing that's, that I'd be interested in reading is what is your SOI, because that's where the person writes about uh, why they're interested in the position 
and uh, what experience they might have. But it, it's, there's just so many sentences here that I'm not quite sure where that, what they all mean. So would we see all the SOIs of everybody who applied for the job? Or would we only see some of them? Evan, I'm gonna have to rely on you. Yeah, so um, let, me, let me provide just, uh, let me answer your question, but just provide a brief bit of um, context. Um, okay. So right, right now, the process that we have um, before it was amended, the process that we used for planning board in January and the process we used um, for ZBA in okay. April, um, that whole process was, um, I was as chair responsible for figuring out who was interested in being in the pool. And so I reached out to anyone who submitted a, uh, a um, community activity form over the past two years and said, Hey, remember two years ago when you said you wanted to be on the ZBA, you still interested. Now, if they said, yes, I didn't, requ they're not required to submit a new CAF. They don't get a new CAF. They just say, yes, I'm still interested. And we said, okay. And they go into the pool. And then those CAFs were forwarded to the town council. So you didn't get the CAF of every person who had ever applied over the past two years because some of them were no longer interested. Some of them had moved. Um, you got the CAFs of the people who were in the pool. So under this process, what would be different is the chair would reach out to those people and they would say, yes, I'm interested. Yes, I'm interested. No, I'm not interested. We'd collect the pool. The people who are in the pool who confirm they're still interested would say they would be the ones who would submit a statement of interest. And then the statement of interest would all be posted publicly and sent to the counselors. So you wouldn't necessarily have the statement of interest of every person who applied over the past three years because some of those people might not be interested in they applied at one time, but they're no longer interested in serving or they moved. But you would have the statement of interest of every person who applied who is currently interested in being appointed to that body. So it's not like a pick and choose who SOIs. Every person who's going to be interviewed, every person who has confirmed they're interested in being appointed would be required to submit an SOI. And those SOIs would be sent uh, to all counselors and also to the posted for the public. Okay. And, and Joe, um, yeah. Okay, me and Joe, let's have a final comment and then we're going to move on. Just going to be quick. Um, two things. One is the whole two year, three year, not everyone's getting it is easily solved at the beginning of every council term. Um, the clerk of the council can go back into the CAFs that have been submitted under those forms for the last three years at that point or whatever and forward them all to every new every counselor that is currently sworn in at that term. So that concern is something that is easily rectified because there are electronic records and can be distributed at any time to any counselor that might be new. Um, I want to remind the council that we are going to be asked to be voting on the CAF amendment and not the process OCA adopted. Um, and it seems like much of this conversation has resulted, it has been around the process and not the CAF amendment. OCA gets its own process. We have to decide what the CAF says. Thank you. Right, this will appear on the uh, agenda on the 18th. Uh, we're moving on to committee reports. Anything from CRC, Mandy Jo? Nothing new. Andy, finance? No, nothing tonight. George, GOL? Nothing tonight. Uh, JCPC, Kathy? No, nothing. Oka, Evan? Uh, just that we're meeting next week and we're going to start to put it together, uh, the selection. I know it feels like we just did appointments because we did, but we're going to start putting together selection guidance um, and talking about the pool for planning board reappointments. So you should expect an email from me in the very near future um, soliciting questions for interview questions for planning board. Okay. TSO, Darcy. Um, we were supposed to have a, an appointment before this. Report. It was done as part of the consent agenda. Oh, oh, it was? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, congratulations, Sarah. <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't really. We we had our second um, 
presentation on the wage theft bylaws and um, we haven't finished with that yet. And then we'll be, um, we'll have the farmer's market on the agenda for the next meeting. And that next meeting is when? We don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, town manager's report, Mr. Bachman. Um, I gave a pretty thorough re report last week and this is just an update report one week ago. So it's not much to add. Um, I want to alert the public to the fact that we are going to be um, having a starting up our district meetings. Uh, the very first one is actually going to be on May 11th, and that's District 4, and it will be at 730. The information will be on the bulletin board. And please watch the bulletin board for others because they will start occurring the week of May 18th. Um, I be, with regard to office hours, I think individual counselors should do however they see fit with their own office hours or together. They can use uh, personal phone numbers, Zoom numbers, whatever. Um, the expectations of the calendar for the rest of 2020, um, I'm still wrestling with this one. Uh, and counselors will be part of agenda setting. I still need to get back to you on that. Uh, I have no further discussion. Uh, are there counselor comments? Yes, Darcy. I just wanted to say that our District 5 meeting is going to be on May 28th at 6 p.m. on okay. Uh Pat. I'd like uh, to wish Andy a happy birthday. <laughs> you beat me to it. 39 again, Andy, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. I get our way. Maybe I should say um, 27 again or something. I have dyslexia, you know. I really don't, but that's okay. Uh, uh, any future items or comments? Andy? No. Okay. Uh, we have no executive unanticipated issues, executive session. Therefore, the meeting is adjourned at 10 minutes, 10 o'clock and 11 minutes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.